हेलो सर वी कैन गो लाइव ओके जस्ट बिफोर गोइंग अहेड आई वुड लाइक टू इंट्रोड्यूस पुनीत सर पुनीत पांड्या सर ज्वाइन न्यू इंडिया इन्शुरस इन डिसेंबर ट्वेंटी टू थाउजेंड थर्टीन currently posted at non suit claims hub surat aro as an assistant manager in last years he is masters in fire engineering marine cargo and hr hull wc and marine export claims so welcome punit sir for taking a sessions for training purpose and uh, over to you please go sir thank you thank you thank you sagar sir yeah thank you for adding the word masters before introducing me <laughs> although it was not mentioned by me uh, uh so good morning everyone good morning good morning sir good, good morning, morning good, sir good morning good morning everyone first of all i would like to congratulate bvks for this amazing initiative uh, for the benefit of all our employees who are appearing for Uh, upcoming promotional examination i hope uh, my voice is uh, audible to everyone right yes sir, audible others can just uh, mention whether it is audible because i am audible yes sir audible yes sir audible yeah great okay okay, okay. so in this session we will uh, discuss about Uh, marine cargo insurance uh, the mysterious marine cargo in insurance i would say because there are many concepts there are many topics or there are many terminologies which are not uh, well known to everyone in our industry the marine cargo insurance is different from uh, other line of business in many ways the principle of insurance as it applies to other line of business uh they do not apply to marine insurance in the same manner of course there are many deviations there are many exemptions there are many changes uh, when it comes to marine cargo insurance marine insurance is also <coughs> different from other uh, pnc property and casualty line of business in the sense that uh the goods are being transited from one point to other point and the insured has little or literally no control over the goods uh, which are being transported from one point to another point and therefore there are exclusions which are conditionals there are uh, warranties which are conditionals so uh, there are also some uh, terminologies which are uh, not Uh, very well explained till date so uh, i'll try my best today to share with you whatever little knowledge i have we will try to understand what is general average what is general average sacrifice what is general average contribution what are salvage charges what are sewn labor charges how salvage charges are different from sewn labor charges what is uh, boat to plane collision liability what are inco terms how insurable interest operates in marine insurance etc so we will begin with uh, history of marine insurance in this uh, presentation i would only uh, stress upon those issues which uh, which are not explain in depth in uh, ic67 that is marine insurance book of uh, insurance institute of india so i would uh, try my best to uh, explain all those concepts here uh, i hope this will be an interactive session and if any of the participant have any uh, queries or they have any doubts they can simply unmute their mic and they can ask uh, their queries okay so uh, we will start with the history of marine insurance uh, i guess there is nothing uh, 
much to talk about uh, regarding this uh, topic. However, we'll uh, still look at this topic because there may be one or two questions in exam. So as we all know that this is uh, oldest form of insurance and it dates back to, I mean, uh, 3000 years back. Uh, marine insurance, and the reference of marine insurance is found in Aryan literature, old Chinese literature other and other literature. Marine insurance in its ancient form was practiced in different countries as below. So these are the, these are not exactly the marine insurance. You can say that these are, these were the tools which were used for risk mitigation or uh, risk transfer. And uh, this is completely different from what we are practicing today. This is not obviously a modern form of marine insurance, but yes. You can say the, these tools were used as an insurance because these were used as a tool of risk transfer. So in India, there was a concept of Jokhmi Hundi. Jokhmi Hundi. Now, what is Hundi? Hundi is a, a type of bill of exchange. There used to be different type of Hundis. Uh, I mean, there were Darshini Hundi and there, uh, there was uh, many Hundi and whatnot. There were, I guess, more than 10 types of Hundi. Uh, and Hundi are nothing but bills of exchange. Okay. So this is one of the Hundi, which is Jokhmi Hundi. So the name itself suggests Jokhmi means risk. So it's a risky Hundi. Now, this particular Hundi, that is Jokhmi Hundi, uh, this was being used as a bill of exchange as well as as an insurance. So in Jokhmi Hundi, the goods uh, shipped on the vessel, so, so the Jokhmi Hundi was usually drawn against the goods shipped on the vessel and uh, it is a combination of bill of exchange as well as insurance. And the Jokhmi Hundi, you have to honor the Jokhmi Hundi only if the goods arrive at the, uh, at the destination, destination safely. Okay. So if anything wrong happens to the goods during the transit, the consigner, that means uh, the consigner cannot claim payment for the Hundi from the consignment. So thus the Jokhmi Hundi safeguard the interest of both the parties. It acts as a bill of exchange. If the goods arrive securely and if the goods are lost, destroyed in transit, such a uh, bill acts as an insurance cover. So whenever the goods arrives safely at the place of destination, the consignee used to honor the Jokhmi Hundi uh, along with its interest. So, so the consignee will repay the principal amount along with, uh, along with its interest. The interest used to be very high. Uh, as compared to other form of Hundis. Um, it is very much obvious that it is a Jokhmi Hundi and the risk on the consigner is very high. So the uh, rate of interest used to be very high as well. Then the, uh, there was Hammurabi's code in uh, Pebilog. Then we have uh, Bottomry and Respondentia bonds. These were same types of financial tools loans were raised against uh, the, the cargo or uh, the cargo or the voyage if the bonds are uh, uh, issued for ship they used to uh, they used to be called bottomry bonds and if it is for cargo then it is uh, respondent share bond so if the ad entire adventure was lost during the transit the uh, loony is not supposed to repay the loan to the financier. And if the adventure arrives safely at the destination, uh, the loony will uh, repay the loan along with the interest amount to the financier. So this was uh, again uh, one type of tool of uh, risk transfer. Now, marine insurance in, it, uh, in its modern form was first transacted around uh, 1310 AD. 
oldest and earliest marine insurance policy in its modern form relates to uh, Mediterranean voyage in 1347, uh, spread from Italy to trading routes in Europe. In the year 1400, a merchant in Florence wrote, uh, wrote a book where premium rates for shipment from London to Pisa were mentioned. Now, so all these points confirms that the marine insurance in its modern form were uh, invented by Italians. They were uh, considered as expert in marine insurance. So Italian merchants from uh, Lombard, who were expert in marine insurance business, finally settled in London to do business and areas were called the uh, Lombard Street. This insurance originated uh, in coffee house owned by Edward Lloyd on Tower Street, where sheep owners, charterers, seafarers, sheep brokers, marine underwriters, etc., used to sit and discuss their business. Uh, so, thus, this branch of insurance flourished in UK, where Hist Historic Lloyd's Association was founded in 1692. So, there used to be a coffee house owned by Edward Lloyd on Tower Street and various um, maritime professionals, be it uh, sheep owners or charters or uh, underwriters or sheep brokers, they used to visit that, uh, that coffee house. And, and they used to discuss uh, about various uh, scenarios and various casualties happening in uh, maritime operations, uh, which ship has arrived at, a, at which port, which ship has departed from which port, uh, what kind of losses they are usually facing during these marine transactions. And they used to discuss all these information. So what happens is Edward Lloyd uh, placed uh, a board there in his coffee house and he used to write all this information uh, from all these uh, maritime professionals. And then this coffee house um, uh, be uh, became center of attraction for all these maritime professionals because they used to have valuable information uh, from this coffee house and which were very uh, which were very beneficial for them the lloyd's list a bulletin containing details of ships was published and circulated from 1696 it is now converted to be no uh, we know Lloyd's Shipping Register. This is oldest magazine in the Guinness Book of Record. In 1871, for the first time, the Lloyd's Act was passed in United Kingdom's Parliament, which gave the business a sound legal footing. So, Lloyd's market has already been established, but it was not regularized. It was an unorganized market. There were not uh, rules and regulations. Uh, to safeguard the interest of all these stakeholders involved. So to streamline all these issues, uh, UK's parliament passed in 1871, the first Lloyd's Act. Then subsequently in 1906, Marine Insurance Act was passed in UK's parliament. In India, Marine Insurance Act 1963 was passed now, this act is literally the replica of Marine Insurance Act 1906 passed by UK. Uh, one of the interesting uh, fact about this Marine Insurance Act 1963 is it is one of the most flexible act. Even after, uh, even being a, uh, an act pa passed by the parliament, it is one of the most flexible act. When I say it is a one, uh, it is one of the most flexible act. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, you will find, uh, you know, certain phrases which are frequently used in almost each and every section of this act. This this act is 92 section long, and you will find that um, unless otherwise specifically excluded in the policy, or subject to any special provision of the policy or subject to any express uh, condition of the policy, this section says so and so. So every section is very flexible. Every section says, if something has not been explicitly mentioned in the policy schedule, or if 
the condition or the provision mentioned in this section is not prohibited by the policy, then and then only the provision of this section applies. So that's why I'm saying that this is one of the most flexible act uh, of our parliament. So I guess uh, uh, for this topic, do you have any doubts? No, sir. Okay. No, no, sir. So principle of marine insurance. Now we'll look into the principle of marine insurance. How principle of marine ins uh, insurance are different from other line of business? Because we all know that uh, there are four principles. The basic principles, at most good faith, insurable interest, okay. principle of indemnity and uh, proximate cause. Then the principle of indemnity, again, has uh, uh, two corollary principles, that is subrogation and contribution. So, yes, uh, to some extent, principle of marine insurance are the same as other line of business, but they are different in some sense that insurable interest applies differently. There is another principle of abandonment, which applies in marine insurance. Uh, which is not applicable in other LOBs. So principle of utmost good faith, like any other contract of insurance, the marine insurance is also subject to principle of utmost good faith. Now, all these principles, we will look, uh, we will look at these principles with their relevant reference to Marine Insurance Act 1963. Because all these principles are explicitly laid down in Marine Insurance Act. And from the exam perspective, as we all know that this is one of the one of those uh, subjects in which conceptual question can be asked. I mean, majority of the conceptual questions are being asked in this particular subject only. So during this session, we will not, uh, you know, stress upon factual question that what are the time limits for this clause and that clause. We will focus on the uh, concepts which were not explained uh, lucidly in uh, our IC67 book. So principle of utmost good faith, like any other contract of insurance, the marine insurance is also subject to principle of utmost good faith. Sections 19 to 23 of Marine Insurance Act deal with the principle of utmost good faith. Yes, there are possibilities uh, that uh, this section number can be asked during uh, your examination. So that's why I'm uh, emphasizing them here. Section 19 to 23 of Marine Insurance Act deals with the uh, principle of utmost good faith. Section 19, the insurance is Ubrima Fidi. That is a contract of marine insurance is a contract based upon the utmost good faith and if the utmost good faith be not observed by either party, the contract may be avoided by the other party. So this section says that the obligation of utmost good faith or the duty of utmost good faith, the duty of utmost good faith uh, has been imposed on both the parties. Yes, Mansi ma'am. Mansi, madam, do, uh, do you want to ask anything? Uh, no. Okay, okay. You have raised the hand, so. Okay. So the duty of uh, utmost good faith has been imposed on both the parties, not only on the insured, but the insurance company as well. And if and if either party is uh, uh, breaching this duty of utmost good faith, the uh, contract may be avoided by the other party. So we uh, usually we are under the uh, impression that the duty of uh, utmost good faith is only on the insured. No, that is completely wrong. The duty of utmost good faith is imposed on insurance company as well. 
disclosure by assured. So what are the kind of disclosure an assured must make? Subject to the provisions of this section. Now look at this phrase. Again, these, these are the phrases which, uh, which make the Marine Insurance Act the most flexible act passed by our parliament. So subject to the provisions of this section, uh, the assured must dis disclose uh, to the insurer before the contract is concluded every material circumstances which is known to the assured and the assured is deemed to know every circumstance which in the ordinary course of business ought to be known to him. If the assured fails to make such disclosure, the insured may avoid the contract. So here the definition of material circumstances has been given. What are the circumstances which uh, an assured is supposed to disclose? So he is supposed to disclose every material circumstances and what, what are the material circumstances? So the assured is deemed to know every circumstance which is in ordinary course of business ought to be known by him. If the assured fails to make such disclosure, the insurer may avoid the contract. So why this provision is here? Uh, because suppose an insured is dealing with hazardous goods. Uh, the, the hazardous goods is uh, susceptible to, uh, you can say, uh, spontaneous combustion or any other phenomena, condensation and or any other phenomena. So what happens is if the uh, assured uh, did not declare that my goods are hazardous goods, they are hazardous in nature and they are highly inflammable. And if uh, the insurance company accept the proposal form on the basis of declaration made by the uh, assured and subsequently at the time of claim, it uh, comes to the notice of the insurance company that these goods were hazardous. So assured cannot take uh, a defense that I did not know that these uh, these were hazardous goods. No, this is not a ground that insured can take at the time of his defense because he is dealing with uh, those goods. He is manufacturing them. He is procuring them. He is trading with them. So he is earning his livelihood with them. He must know uh, what are the properties of goods I am dealing with. He must know that these are the uh, you know, these are the uh, potential hazards associated with my goods and I must, declare, uh, I must disclose them to the insurance company. And if the assured fails to make such disclosure, the insurance company may avoid the contract. Okay. Okay, so every circumstance is material which influence the judgment of a prudent insurer in fixing the premium or determining whether he will take the risk or not. So this is the exact definition of material fact or material circumstances. Any material fact which influence the judgment of a prudent insurer in fixing the premium or deciding whether he will going to accept the risk or not is considered as material. In the absence of inquiry, the following circumstances need not be disclosed. Namely, now this section, subsection 3 of section 20, Marine Insurance Act. This section provides exemption to the insurer. Exemption from disclosing certain information to the insurance company. So if at the time of claim, it comes to the... Uh, insurance company that the insurer has not disclosed certain information and if that information falls under any of these four uh, points then the insurance company cannot take the ground that um, the material information has been uh, suppressed or uh, not disclosed to the insurance company and therefore the contract becomes viable no so these are the four exemptions given to the insured under Marine Insurance Act. The first is any circumstance which diminishes the risk. Okay, so the insured is supposed to disclose only those circumstances which increases the risk uh, or, or uh, which may result into potential liability for the insurance company. But 
he is not supposed to disclose any fact or information which diminishes the risk okay any circumstance which is uh, known or presumed to be known to the insurer the insurer is presumed to know matters of common notoriety or knowledge and matters which can which an insurer in the ordinary course of business as such ought to know okay so this is one of the exemption so if an insurer comes to you and he says i want to ship my consignment to russia or ukraine okay and he wants cover uh, for icca as well as warren srcc okay so if the goods were damaged due to war happening between russia and ukraine the insurance company subsequently cannot take a ground that you have not disclosed that there there was war between russia and ukraine no it is a matter of common fact it's a one of the most talked about in a worldwide phenomena and the insurer in his uh, uh, ordinary course of business is ought to know this uh, phenomena that there is um, there is a war going on between russia and ukraine and uh, i must uh, accept this uh, consignment after due diligence after exercising all my uh, prudent underwriting practices okay so this is again uh, one of the exemption given to the insured any circumstance as to which information is waived by the insurer if insurer himself is waiving any information then the insurer is not supposed to disclose uh, that information any circumstance which is uh, uh, which it is superfluous to disclose by reason of any express or implied warranty now whether any particular circumstance which is not disclosed to be material or not in each case a question of fact so this section says this sub section says that there cannot be a complete exhaustive definition of material fact okay and uh, one particular circumstance is under such under so and so particular situation may be material to the loss and for different situation it may not be material to the loss so whether any particular circumstance is uh, material to the loss or not is a question of fact uh, and it has to be determined on its merit okay the term circumstance includes any communication made to or information received by the assured disclosure by agent affecting insurance so now uh, under marine insurance act apart from the insured the insured's agent or the insured's intermediary is also under the obligation to disclose uh, any information or uh, particular which is material to the loss so subject to the provisions of uh, preceding section where an insurance is affected by an assured uh, for, when an insurance is affected by an agent for the assured the agent must disclose to the insurer every material circumstance which is known to himself and an agent is insure uh, agent to insure is deemed to know every circumstance which in the ordinary course of business ought to be known by by or have been communicated to him every material circumstance which which the assured is bound to disclose unless it comes to his knowledge too late to communicate it to the agent so under marine insurance act along with insured insured's agent who is effecting insurance on behalf of uh, of his insured is also under the duty to disclose material circumstances representation spending negotiation of the contracts every material representation made by the assured or his agent to the insurer during the negotiation for the contract and before the contract is concluded must be true if if it be untrue the insurer may avoid the contract so there are types of representation if the representation is material we have already uh, 
discuss the definition of material circumstances. What are material circumstances which influence the decision of an underwriter in deciding the premium and in deciding whether he is going to accept the risk or not. So if a representation is material to the laws, it has to be true. It must be true. And if it is untrue, the insurance company may avoid the contract. Again, what, uh, what is material representation? A representation is material which would influence the judgment of a prudent insurer in fixing the premium or determining whether he will take the risk or not. Okay. A representation may be either uh, maybe either as to a matter of fact or as to a matter of expectation or belief. A representation as to a matter of fact uh, is true if it is substantially correct. That is to say, if the difference between uh, what is represented and what is actually correct would not be considered material by a prudent insurer. So what, what are the type of representation which can be considered as matter of fact? So all those uh, representations over which the insured has uh, control, some control, uh, those representations will be considered as matter of fact. For example, uh, nature of commodity or you can say some insured of the cargo. So these are uh, the representations which uh, which is uh, which are considered as matter of fact so it has to be subst substantially true and if the difference between uh, what has been represented and what is actually there must not be material okay so again representations over which the insured has some sort of control or information, solid information, those are considered as matter of fact. Now, a representation as to matter of expectation or belief is true if it is made in good faith. Now, what are the representations which are matter of uh, expectation or belief? It is contrary to what, is, what we have understood in matter of fact. So all those representation over which the insured has little or literally no control. Those are considered as representation as to matter of expectation or belief. For example, your uh, insured is uh, an importer of say ABC cargo. He is importing his cargo from uh, South Africa. Okay. So he has taken insurance policy from you. Now he has declared that the cargo is going to be shipped or the vessel is going to be dispatched on 4th of June 2023. Now this is a fact, this is a representation over which the insured has little or no control because this information has been provided to the insured from his overseas consigner. His overseas consigner has informed him that uh, I'm going to ship your cargo uh, on 4th of June 2023. Okay. So if the cargoes are not shipped on 4th of June, and he has made this declaration in good faith, because he has been uh, provided with this information uh, from his overseas consigner, and he has made this declaration in good faith. So if the goods are not shipped on, uh, say, 4th June 2023, for whatever reason, then the goods are actually shipped on 10th June or 11th June. Okay. So... Again, this, uh, this is a representation as to mat a matter of expectation and belief. And uh, it was true. Although the actual date of dispatch of or sailing of vessel is 10th or 11th June, instead of 4th June 2023, it is considered as true because it was made in good faith. So the insurance company subsequently cannot take the ground that the actual date of sailing of vessel is different from what you have declared in your proposal form or declarations and hence your claim is not payable. No, we do not have that ground here. Okay. A representation may be withdrawn or corrected before the contract is concluded uh, unless and until the premium has been paid and the contract has not been concluded. 
either party are at liberty to uh, make corrections in the representations or declarations made by them okay whether a particular representation be material or not is in case a question of fact again there cannot be an exhaustive or complete definition of material representations a representation is material to certain circumstances or not has to be decided on its merit and it's a question of fact you uh, you cannot treat each and every uh, claim uh, based on a material representation on one particular thumb rule there cannot be one thumb rule for deciding whether a representation is material or not it has to be decided on its merit okay section 23 says when contract is deemed to be concluded the contract of marine insurance is deemed to be concluded when the proposal of the assured is accepted by the insurer whether the policy be then issued or not and for the purpose of showing when the proposal was accepted the reference may be made to the slip covering note or other customary memorandum of contract although it be unstamped now this practice is no longer in our market uh, we are issuing policy as as soon as we are in receipt of the premium and we have done away with this requirement of uh, issuing slip or cover note or any other customary memorandum okay so this section is not so important okay so in this section of utmost good faith do you have any doubts no sir no sir okay now warranties what are the warranties section 35 to 43 of marine insurance act 1963 deals with the warranties section 35 nature of warranty a warranty in the following sections relating to warranties means a promissory warranty that is to say a warranty by which a short undertakes that some particular thing shall or shall not be done or that uh, some condition shall be fulfilled or uh, whereby he affirms or negatives uh, the existence of a particular state of facts okay so why we need warranties in the first place that is the question what is the need of warranties so in marine insurance we have uh, many types of policies okay we have a specific voyage policy we have blanket policies blanket policies like open policies open cover agreements and then we have annual sales turnover policies annual policies etc okay we will going to look at those policies later on now when an insurer is uh giving a blanket policy to its customer uh he will you know the, there will be mutual agreement between the insured and the insurance company on certain terms and conditions of the policy that this will be the nature of commodity this will be the nature of packing material this will be per bottom limit per location limit these are the coverages and exclusions this will be policy rate these are the terms and conditions and warranties okay so the insurance company does not have the information of each and every particular consignment which will be shipped under that blanket policy so to safeguard uh, his interest the insurance company will always incorporate certain warranty in uh, in his insurance contract that certain uh, state of affairs or some particular thing shall or shall not be done or that some condition shall be fulfilled or whereby he affirms or negatives the existence of a particular state of facts okay so there there could be a number of uh, warranties that an underwriter will incorporate in his insurance contract for example the goods must be shipped uh, on a classed vehicle on a classed vessel only 
the vessel warranted vessel must be less than 15 years or 25 years or whatever okay uh, warranty of closed vehicle that the goods must be shipped in a closed vehicle or if the vehicle is not closed if it is open the, the vehicle should be sufficiently covered with tarpaulins to uh, avoid the ingress of water so these are the kind of warranties because the insurance company uh, wants to safeguard uh, the interest uh, so warranties are incorporated in the policy a warranty may be express or implied there are two kinds of warranties express warranty and implied warranty a warranty is about defined this is a condition which must be exactly complied with whether it be material to the risk or not if it be uh, not so complied with, then subject to any express provision in the policy, the insurer is discharged from liability as from the date of the breach of warranty, but without prejudice to any liability incurred by him before that date. Now, this is the major difference between a warranty and a condition. So, you must have gone through our um, insurance contracts and uh, you must have observed that the uh, there are terms and conditions of the policies. Then there, uh, there is warranty uh, and there is condition precedent to liability. Some of you might have heard this word as well, that there is a condition precedent to liability. So warranty is in line with condition precedent to liability. So this is the section, uh, subsection three, which separates a warranty from a condition. So what is the major difference between a, uh, uh, between the warranty and the condition is that when there is a breach of a condition, the insurance company will check whether such breach is material to the loss or not. Okay. So if there is a breach of condition, he will check whether the, uh, the breach of condition has contributed towards the loss in any manner, whether the breach of condition has contributed towards the cause of loss or, or whether it has aggravated the loss, he, the insurance company will check all these points. And if the insurance company is satisfied that the, the breach of condition is in no way material to the loss, okay. So if the condition would have been complied with, the loss still would have been taken place and uh, there is no materiality to the loss, the insurance company cannot invoke the breach of condition against the insured. I repeat, the insurance company cannot invoke the breach of condition against the insured. That is not the case with warranty. So if a warranty is incorporated in the policy, it must be complied with, irrespective of any circumstances, irrespective of whether the breach of warranty is material to the loss, irrespective of the fact that even if the warranty would have been complied, the loss, the loss still would have taken place. The uh, breach of warranty uh, will give right to the insurance company to make the contract voidable. Again, a warranty as defined above is a condition which must be exactly complied with, whether it be material to the risk or not. Even if it is immaterial to the loss, it makes the contract voidable at the, at the option of the insurance company. So again, a warranty is uh, identical to what you can say, a condition precedent to liability. A condition precedent to liability, again, is on the same principle of warranty. It must be complied with. I'll, I'll give you an example. There is, there is a condition precedent to liability in your mach machinery breakdown insurance policy, there is a condition number three. That condition number three of machinery breakdown insurance says that uh, a steam turbine or, or I guess a turbine must be overhauled uh, in a completely opened up state in presence of representatives of OEM, original equipment manufacturer, at some I guess uh, interval of two years. Okay, now. In that condition, uh, it has been explicitly mentioned that this is a condition precedent to liability of the insurance company that uh, provision of this condition must be complied with. That means 
uh, if the insured has not complied with that condition, if he has not gone for overhauling of the uh, turbine completely opened up state, and there is a loss under machinery breakdown policy, and if the surveyor confirms that, uh, even if the insured has overhauled the turbine, the loss still would have occurred, okay, the loss is not at all payable. If a condition precedent to liability or a warranty is not uh, complied with, the contract becomes voidable. When a breach of warranty is excused. So what are the circumstances? Again, then we, uh, we have a section 22, subsection 3, which gives exemption to the uh, insured. Section 20, subsection 3, which gives exemption to the insured from disclosing certain material facts. Now we have exemption under warranty. When the breach of warranty is excused, Non-compliance with the warranty is excused when by reason of change of circumstances, the warranty ceases to be applicable to the circumstances of the contract or when compliance with the warranty is rendered unlawful by any subsequent law. Okay. So what happens is, suppose you are an underwriter and you have incorporated a warranty that warranted goods or consignment must be shipped on a classed vessel, okay? And the insured has complied with their warranty. He has shipped his good on classed vessel, or classified by uh, one of the member of IACS, International Association of Classification Society. Okay, now the vessel has sailed from uh, the port of loading. And during journey, the vessel has encountered uh, some uh, high stress or some maritime peril. Okay, now the vessel is damaged. The, the journey is not completed yet. The journey is pending and the vessel is damaged during the transit. Okay, so since the vessel is damaged, the classification society has withdrawn its classification. Okay, so the classification society has withdrawn its, its classification and if subsequently there is a damage to the cargo, you cannot invoke breach of warranty against the insurer because that breach of warranty has been excused by virtue of this section 36. Okay, so non-compliance of uh, non-compliance with a warranty is excused when, by reason uh, of a change of circumstances, the warranty ceases to be applicable. Now, here the change of circumstances here: the vessel has encountered maritime perils it is damaged and the classification society has withdrawn its classification. So these are the change of circumstances. And due to this, uh, that change of circumstances, the warranty ceases to be applicable. So under these circumstances only, the breach of warranty is excused and the insurance company cannot invoke uh, a breach of warranty against the insured. Where a warranty is broken, the assured cannot avail himself of defense that the breach has been remedied and the warranty complied with before loss. So if the during the entire journey or during an entire tra transit, the warranty has been breached once, but it has been remedied, or you can say the uh, it has been complied with again. So this ground is not available with the insured. It must be complied with during the entire journey. A breach of warranty may be viewed by the insurer and we are doing, we are following this practice only, okay. Although we have right to avoid the, uh, avoid our liability when, as, as soon as there is a breach of warranty, we do not uh, invoke breach of warranty in a practical, okay, because we have some commercial constraint, we have influence of market inside as well and whatnot. So, uh, when, uh, whenever there is a breach of warranty, again, we will look whether it is material to the loss and then only we will uh, we, uh, waive the breach of warranty. Express warranty. An express warranty may be in form of words from which uh, the intention to warrant is be informed. Express warranty has to be in written. It should be explicitly mentioned in your contract of insurance. Okay, an express warranty must be included uh, in or written upon the policy must be uh, contained in some document incorporated by reference into the policy. An express warranty does not exclude implied warranty unless it be inconsistent therewith. That means express warranty has to be read together with in conjunction of implied warranty. An express warranty 
usually uh, does not supersede an implied warranty unless there is some inconsistency between the express warranty and the implied warranty. For example, we have an implied warranty of unseaworthiness of the vessel. Okay. But there is no such implied warranty of unseaworthiness of the goods. There is no such implied warranty that the goods, uh, goods shipped on a uh, seaworthy vessel uh, must be uh, seaworthy. So, but if there is an express warranty that uh, goods must be seaworthy, then there is an inconsistency between uh, an express warranty and an implied warranty. And in that case, express warranty will always supersede implied warranty. Warranty of seaworthiness of ship. So, a, a, a ship under which uh, the goods are shipped by the insured must be seaworthy during the commencement of the risk or commencement of the uh, uh, transit. Okay. So when uh, the journey is performed in different stages, for example, uh, there are transshipments at intermediate ports. Okay. So during these uh, transshipments, the ship is supposed to be seaworthy during commencement of each stage or each transit from the port, uh, intermediate port or port of transshipment. A ship is deemed to be seaworthy when she is reasonably fit in all aspects to encounter the ordinary perils of sea of the adventure of the issue. Okay, so this is warranty of seaworthiness of a vessel or ship. There is no implied warranty that the goods must be seaworthy. And again, there is uh, implied warranty of legality that the adventure must be lawful. Okay. We are not supposed to ensure uh, uh, goods which are illegal, which are contraband, or uh, which are smuggled good, goods. So this is an implied warranty, even if it is not written in the contract of insurance. If the consignment or the adventure of the insured is unlawful, contraband, or it is illegal, the insurance company can avoid its liability. So these were the warranties under Marine Insurance Act 1963. Any questions? No, sir. No, sir. principle of insurable interest. Now, this is the area where the marine insurance line of business is uh, very different from other LOBs. Sections 6 to 17 of Marine Insurance Act 1963 deals with the subject of insurable interest. Now, first we will talk about other LOBs, for example, fire insurance or engineering insurance. So, uh, when should the uh, insurable interest exist in a fire insurance policy or an engineering insurance policy. So, um, an insurable interest must exist at the time of taking the policy. It must be continued uh, during the currency of the policy and it must exist at the time of loss. This is the condition of insurable interest for other line of business that the insurable interest must ex exist at the time of taking the policy it should be continued uh, during the currency of the policy and must exist at the time of loss. That is not the case here. The insurable interest uh, should exist at the time of loss only. Even if there was no insurable interest at the time of effect in the insurance, if the insurable interest is there at the time of loss, the insured or the claimant can uh, claim benefit under the insurance policy. So section seven insurable interest has been defined here. Subject to the provisions of this act, every person has an insurable interest who is interested in a marine adventure. So this section gives uh, the scope for incorporation of any other party apart from a buyer and a seller uh, who can acquire insurable interest in a maritime adventure. Okay, so it could be ship owner, it could be a freight forwarder, it could be any other party. In particular, a person is interested in a marine adventure where he stands in uh, any legal or equitable relation to the adventure or to any 
insurable property at risk therein, in consequence of which he may be benefited by uh, the safety or due arrival of insurable property or may be prejudiced by its loss or by damage thereto. So this is the exact definition of an insurable interest. When insurable interest must attach, the assured must be interested in the subject matter insured at the time of loss, though he need not be interested when the insurance is effected. Okay. So, uh, as we know that in most of the married adventure, the goods which are being transshipped uh, from uh, one point to another are under contract of sale. So, there are two parties to the contract one is seller, one is buyer, and the Ownership of the goods uh, is being trans. Uh, I mean, is being transited from the seller to the buyer. So both will have insurable interest at some point of time. Okay. So if the seller uh, is effecting insurance on behalf of the buyer under, say, CIF contract under any contract uh, contractual obligation, the buyer did not have insurable interest at the time of effecting insurance. But yes, at the time of loss, uh, that is after the FOB point, uh, he can acquire the insurable interest. Okay. Where the assured has no uh, interest at the time of loss, he cannot acquire interest by any act or election, of, uh, election after he is aware of the loss. So this subsection says that uh, an insured is not supposed to acquire insurable interest after changing the uh, contract of sale or contract of operatement after the loss. When he is aware of the loss, he cannot change the contract of sale or contract of operatement and then uh, he can acquire the insurable interest. That is not permissible by virtue of this section, subsection. Defeasible or contingent interest. So these are the two types of uh, insurable interest and both are insurable. A defeasible ins interest is insurable as well as contingent in interest is also insurable. Okay, so what is the defeasible interest? A defeasible insurable interest is one which can be brought to end uh, during the currency of the insurance by the occurrence of some event other than maritime perils. Okay, so for example, there is a seller and a buyer. A seller is uh, uh, sending the goods to the buyer under, say, FOB or CFR, free on board or co uh, cost and freight in good terms. Okay. So as long as uh, the goods are not being uh, loaded on, uh, on board the vessel, the, the insurable interest rests with the seller. Okay. But as soon as the uh, goods pass, uh, passes the ship's rail and placed safely on board the vessel, the risk transfers from the seller to buyer. And since the risk transfer from seller to buyer, the insurable interest also transfer from seller to buyer. So this is one of the occurrence. It is not an uh, it is not a maritime peril. Okay, there has to be some occurrence which is uh, other than maritime peril. So uh, here in this example, the occurrence is delivery under the contract of sale, which, which was FOB or CFR. So as, as soon as there is a delivery, the insurable interest of the seller comes to an end. So this type of insurable interest is considered as defeasible interest. Contingent interest is an interest that attaches during the currency of a voyage on happening of a contingency. Now this contingency uh, could be anything. Here in this case, the occurrence should be something which is not a maritime peril. As, uh, as far as defeasible interest is concerned, the occurrence uh, should be something which is not a maritime peril. However, in this contingent interest, there, uh, there, there could be happening of any contingency. It could be maritime peril, it could be other than maritime peril. So a contingent interest is an interest that attaches during the currency of a voyage on happening of a contingency. Again, the goods are shipped on FOB or CFR basis. 
so after the FOB point, now what is FOB point? The FOB point is considered as when the goods passes the ship's rail and placed safely on board the vessel. That point is considered as the FOB point. So after the FOB point, the risk transfers from seller to buyer and subsequently the insurable interest also transfers from seller to buyer. Okay. So uh, in most of the times, the goods are uh, shipped on credit. That means the, uh, the seller gives facility to the buyer uh, for payment of the consignment for say 30 days or 60 days uh, after date of delivery. So what happens is after delivery, if uh, when the goods reaches to the uh, uh, buyer and if the buyer finds that the goods are not uh, in sound condition, and they are damaged and he, uh, the buyer is uh, rejecting the goods. Okay, so in that case, uh, what happens is the seller has complied with uh, his obligation under the contract of sale. That is, he has delivered the goods as per the contract of sale. Although the buyer has not made any payment towards the shipment. So he still uh, has the insurable interest because he has delivered the goods as per contract of sale and the payment has not been made yet. Okay. So he has contingent interest in that in uh, this scenario he has contingent interest okay any question regarding insurable interest no sir no sir okay. assignment of insurance policy so there are three sections of Marine Insurance Act. That is uh, section 17, 52, 53, which are concerned with assignment of the insurance policy. Okay. Now we will look at all these uh, three sections in order of their relevance. Okay. Marine insurance policies are freely assignable unless specifically prohibited. So most of the times, marine insurance policies are freely assignable. A marine insurance policy, why marine insurance policies are assignable? Because there are more than one parties involved in a maritime adventure who are concerned with that shipment, who will be benefited by safe arrival of that shipment and uh, who will be prejudiced by uh, damage or loss of that shipment. So there are more than one parties involved in a maritime adventure. And therefore, since uh, ownership of a good passes from one person to another person during the transit, policy has to be assignable. However, assignment is not automatic. Assignment is not automatic. There has to be uh, some sort of agreement for an assignment to take place. And we will look at this uh, uh, point uh, in detail. Section 52, when and how policy is assignable. A marine policy may be transferred by assignment unless it contains terms expressly prohibiting assignment. Okay, so again, this is one of the flexible uh, section. What uh, this section says is marine policies are not always assignable. Okay, <laughs> marine policy, marine, a marine policy is assignable only if there is no express term or condition which prohibits assignment under the policy. Okay, so marine policy may be transferred by assignment unless it contains uh, contains terms expressly prohibit prohibiting assignment. It may be assigned either before loss or after loss. Okay, the, pol uh, the marine policy can be assigned uh, even the, uh, after the loss has taken place. However, there are certain policies which are not assignable. And these are the examples of uh, those policies which are not assignable. Sailor's contingency or sailor's interest insurance policy, buyer's contingency policy, increased value insurance due to insurance and annual policy or inter-depot transfer policy. Okay. We'll discuss all these policies in details later on. Where a marine policy has been assigned to uh, 
assigned so as to pass the bene uh, beneficial interest in such policy the assignee of the policy is en entitled to sue thereon in his own name and the uh, defendant is entitled to make any defense arising out of the contract which he would have been entitled to make if the suit has been had been brought in the name of the person by or on behalf of whom the policy has or the policy was effected this subsection says that what are the rights given to the assignee by virtue of this assignment so this section says that not only the assignee can claim insurance uh, insurance claim amount from from the insurance company under the insurance policy the assignee can also sue the insurance company in a court of law after he has been assigned the policy so these are the rights given to the assignee he can even sue the uh, uh, insurance company in a court of law because in absence of this uh, subsection uh, subsection the insurance company will ask uh, the assignee what, uh, what local standing you have to sue me in a court of law there is an insurance contract between me and my assured the my assured has assigned you the policy but you cannot sue me in a court of law had there been no uh, this subsection the, the assignee would not have been given the right of uh, suing the insurance company in a court of law a marine insurance policy may be assigned by endorsement thereon or in other customary manner okay so in uh, ancient time the seller used to uh, write name of the buyer or consignee on the back side of the policy schedule and just simply uh, signing it and stamping it by signing it and stamping it he uh, used to assign the policy to the buyer so this was the uh, practice which was uh, which was in place years ago but now we are explicitly mentioning the name of consignee in the policy section uh, 17 assignment of interest where the assured assigns or otherwise uh, parts his uh, part uh, parts with his interest in the subject matter insured he does not thereby transfer to the assignees his rights under the contract of insurance unless there be an express or implied agreement with the assignee to that effect so this section says that simply says that the assignment is not automatic marine insurance policies are freely assignable but the assignment is not automatic okay there has to be some sort of express condition express agreement mutual agreement between the consigner or consignee seller or buyer and insured and uh, his uh, assignee there has to be some sort of express condition agreement which uh, facilitates the assignment so just uh, simply i have taken a policy and i have written name of my consignee in the policy that Uh, this is my consignee to whom i am shipping my goods so they, uh, that doesn't mean that the policy has been assigned to that person unless there is a contractual obligation or there is any express condition so here is the example uh, the buyer purchases goods from the seller on cif basis where there is an obligation on the seller to arrange insurance cover against the buyer's risk uh, for loss of or damage to the goods Uh, from the port of shipment to at least port of destination this will be considered as an express agreement between the seller and buyer okay so if your insurance policy uh, so under your insurance policy if the seller is sending goods on cif in co terms okay and under the cif in co terms there is an obligation on the seller uh, to arrange insurance on behalf of the buyer so there is an contractual obligation there is an agreement Uh, in place by which uh, which expressly states that this insurance has been arranged by the seller on behalf of the buyer so in this case the ass assignment becomes automatic and there is no need for expressly assigning the policy in favor of consignee so the, uh, i guess this section is clear the assignment is not automatic there has to be some sort of explicit agreement conditions in place which facilitates the assignment section 53 assured who has no interest cannot assign 
for an insured to assign the policy in favor of someone in favor of his buyer first of all he has uh, he has to have insurable interest at the time of assigning the policy okay so where the assured has parted with or lost his uh, interest in the subject matter insured and has not before or at the time of so doing expressly or impliedly agreed to assign the policy any subsequent assignment of the policy is inoperative provided that nothing in this section affects the assignment of policy after a loss so that uh, this is the clarification to section 53 that yes an insured can assign the policy after the loss there is no prohibition on assignment of a policy after the loss but the insured cannot assign a policy after he has lost his insurable interest in the goods so at the time of assigning the policy has uh, he must have insurable interest in the goods and then and then only he can assign the policy in favor of buyer or any other party so here is the example the seller is sending goods on fob and cfr term okay so what happens under fob and cfr terms there is no obligation on either party for arranging insurance okay under fob and cfr inco terms uh, there is no obligation on seller to arrange insurance on behalf of the buyer which was the case under cif inco term okay and uh, for fob and cfr inco terms when does the risk transfers from seller to buyer at fob point i have already explained what is an fob point so at fob point the risk from uh, risk transfers from seller to buyer so for example the goods have already become fob that uh, that means the uh, the goods have already passed the ship's rail and they are placed safely on board the vessel so at this point the insurable interest of the seller ceases to exist there is no insurable interest uh, of the seller after the fob point so before fob point if the seller has not assigned the policy in favor of buyer then after he uh, loses his insurable interest in the goods he cannot assign the policy subsequently okay so the seller uh, the seller is sending goods on fob and cfr term according to which the seller is deemed to have uh, delivered the goods once the goods passes the ship's rail and placed safely on board the vessel the seller has insured the goods only up to fob point the seller cannot assign insurance policy in, in favor of buyer after fob point any questions regarding assignment of the policy clear sir principle of indemnity so uh, unlike in uh, fire insurance policy and uh, engineering insurance policies which are subject to a principle of strict indemnity marine insurance policy are not considered as a principle of strict indemnity okay the, 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 there are uh, marine insurance policies like duty insurance policies in fixed value insurance policies which are subject to principle of strict indemnity but most of the times the marine policies are not subject to principle of strict indemnity uh, in the sense that these policies are valued policies okay so unless otherwise specifically prohibited again unless otherwise specifically prohibited if your policy is not prohibiting the marine insurance policies are valid policies so there is prohibition uh, prohibition under duty insurance policies and increased value insurance policy uh, for issuing a valued policy under those heads so unless otherwise specifically prohibited marine policies are valued policies section 29 valued policies policy may be either valued policy or unvalued policy okay a valued policy is a policy which specifies the agreed value of the subject matter insured so what happens is uh, when an insured comes to you 
and he wants a blanket policy like open policy or annual sales turnover policy and uh, you will uh, the insurance company and the insured will mutually agreed upon a certain basis of valuation and that basis of valuation makes it a valued policy it could be uh, c plus 0% that is only cost if the insured wants to insure only the cost of the uh, uh, cost of the goods he uh, he has th that option as well so it could be C plus zero, it could be CIA plus 10%, it could be F, uh, FOB plus 10%. So what does this basis of valuation represent? So the basis of valuation represents that uh, each and every consignment falling under the scope of the policy coverage uh, will be declared by the insured as per this basis of valuation only. So if the CIF value of a good is 100 rupees and the basis of valuation under the policy is CIF plus 10%, the insured is supposed to declare the consignment uh, as 100 rupees plus 10%, that is per 110 rupees. And this is the obligation on the part of the insured by virtue of a policy being valued policy. So this is the obligation on part of the insurer. Now, what is the obligation on part of the insurance company? So at the time of loss, the insurance company will settle the claim as per the provisions of basis of valuation only. So if uh, the goods are insured for CIF plus 10%, that is 110 rupees, suppose. And if there is a uh, loss of CIF values, CIF value of 50 rupees to the insurer, the insurance company will not pay 50 rupees, but the insurance company will pay 50 rupees plus 10% extra as per basis of valuation because the insurance company has agreed for the basis of valuation and the, the company has charged premium accordingly. So uh, the insurance company will pay 50 rupees plus 10% extra that is 55 rupees. So subject to the provisions of this act and in the absence of uh, fraud valued fixed by the policy is as between the insurer and the assured conclusive of insurable value of the subject intended to be insured, whether the loss be total or the partial. Okay. So you subsequently, you cannot take uh, the ground that the, there is no total loss and it is just a partial loss and we will not pay claim according to basis of valuation. No, the basis of valuation, the, the nature of valued policy is applicable on total loss, uh, total loss uh, uh, cases as well as partial loss cases. So the value fixed by the policy as between the insurer and the assured is conclusive of insurable value of subject matter intended to be insured. Unless the policy otherwise provides the value fixed by the policy is not conclusive for the purpose of determining whether there has been a constructive total loss. So Whether uh, a loss is a constructive total loss or not, uh, it will not depend on the value fixed by the policy because the definition of constructive total loss is different in marine insurance policy. Now, uh, you might be wondering that how it is different from other LOPs. Uh, for example, in uh, motor insurance policy under general regulation number eight, we have uh, definition of constructive total loss that if it exceeds 75% of the IDP. Okay. This is not the case here. In marine insurance policy, the definition of constructive total loss is that the cost of repairing or retrieving the goods uh, is more than the value of the goods when retrieved. Okay. The cost, I, I, I'm repeating, the cost of retrieving or repairing the uh, goods is more than the value of goods when retrieved, then in that case, it will be considered as constructive total loss. Okay. Me uh, measure of insurable value. Okay. Subject to any express provision or valuation in the policy, the insurable value of the subject matter insured must, uh, must be ascertained as follows. I have deleted irrelevant section of this act. Only the relevant part has been reproduced here. Uh, in insurance on goods or merchandise, the insurable value is the prime cost of property insured plus the expenses of and incidental to shipping and the charges of insurance upon the whole. Okay. 
So uh, what does it imply? It implies that it is talking about CIF value. In insurance on goods or merchandise, the insurable value is prime cost of property insured, that is C, your cost, plus the expenses of and incidental to shipping, that is your freight, F, and charges of insurance upon the whole, that is your insurance, I. So it, it is talking about CIF value. So in any insurance policy, if the basis of valuation has not been determined, it, it was if the basis of valuation was not fixed at the time of taking the policy between the insurance company and the insurer in, in, insured, what will be the measure of insurable value? It will follow the fortune of section 18 of Marine Insurance Act, which clearly defines that subject to any express provision or valuation in the policy. If there, if there is any express valuation, basis of valuation or provision in the policy, then this section will not be applicable. But in absence of uh, uh, such express provision, the insurable value of the subject matter insured must be ascertained as follows. Okay. Section 30, unvalued policy. An unvalued policy is a policy which does not specify the value of the subject matter insured but subject to the limit of some insured leaves the insurable value uh, to be subsequently ascertained in the manner uh, he, hearing before explained. So under an unvalued policy, there is no uh, express basis of valuation agreed between the insured and the insurance company. And uh, there is only a sum insured. Okay. So in case of a loss, the loss will be paid on actual basis subject to limits of some insured. What are the examples of unvalued policies? Uh, increased value insurance policy and duty insurance policies. These are two examples of unvalued policies. Any question regarding principle of indemnity? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. Principle of contribution. Okay. Uh, the principle of contribution applies uh, uh, to some extent uh, identical to other line of business. Section 34 deals with double insurance. Uh, so in our insurance language, we uh, say it, the principle of contribution. Where two or more policies are affected by or on behalf of the assured on the same adventure and interest or any part thereof, and the sum insured exceeds uh, the indemnity allowed by this act, the assured is said to be over-insured by double insurance. Okay. So this is the condition for, an, uh, for two policies to be considered as double insurance. What are the conditions that the, there should be two or more policies affected by or on behalf of the assured? Okay on the same adventure or and interest or on or any part thereof and this is the most important condition the sum insured exceed the indemnity allowed by this act and then and then only the assured is said to be over insured by virtue of double insurance so if the value of goods is uh, 100 rupees and he has uh, arranged two different insurance policy from two different insurance company for some insured of rupees 45 rupees each okay so total sum insured is 45 plus 45 that is 90 rupees against the value of property which is 100 rupees so in this case uh, it will not be considered as double insurance and the insured uh, and the insured can claim 45 rupees uh, to the fullest from both the insurance company so for a double insurance to take place, sum of all the insurance policy affected by or on the behalf of the insured must exceed the value of the property. Where the assured is over insured by double insurance, what will, what will be the position? The assured, unless the policy otherwise provides, may claim payment from the insurers in such order as he may think fit, provided that he is not entitled to receive any sum in excess of indemnity allowed by this act. Okay. 
So there is a right to the assured given by virtue of this uh, section 34. Obviously, this right is conditional upon the fact that there should not be any contradictory terms and conditions in the contract of insurance. So the assured, unless the policy otherwise provides. So if there is a provision otherwise to this subsection in the policy, the provision of this subsection will not be applicable. The assured may claim payment from the insurer in such order he may think fit. Okay. So usually what happens in SFSP policy, uh, suppose uh, you are an insurer and you come to know that uh, there is other subsisting insurance uh, which has been arranged by insured or uh, say uh, banker of the insured on behalf of the insured. So what happens is if there is a loss of 100 rupees and there is a contribution of 50-50 from both the insurance company. Okay. So the, uh, the insurance company, both the insurance company will pay only their rateable proportion of loss only. I will pay my 50 rupees and I'll ask the insured to get the other 50 rupees from the other insurance company. So that is the case in SFSP policy. However, in marine insurance, the, uh, the doctrine of double insurance says that uh, the insured, the insured may claim payment from the insurer in such order as he may think fit. Okay, he has the right to claim entire amount from one insurer. However, when he do so, where the assured receives any sum in excess on the indemnity allowed by this act, he is deemed to hold such a uh, sum in trust of, uh, for the insurer according to their, their right of contribution among themselves. So if he exercise uh, this right, then the insurance company will take a subrogation letter from the insured and go for a recovery against the other insurance companies. Okay. Now this provision, this similar provision has been incorporated as contribution clause in your Bharat Lagu Sukshma and uh, uh, Lagu Udyam Suraksha policy and Sukshma Udyam Suraksha policy. The contribution clause of those two policies are similar to this one, this uh, section 34 of Marine Insurance Sector, under which the insured has right to claim under any of the policy in any manner. And the insurance company cannot uh, enforce the insured to claim uh, the rateable proportion uh, from other insurance company. He has to pay the claim amount uh, in full to the insured. Uh, to, to the, insured. the principle of abandonment. Now this is uh, one of the most uh, uh, confusing area uh, in marine insurance. What is principle of abandonment and how it is different from uh, principle of subrogation? So these are the sections, section 61, section 62 uh, of marine insurance uh, act, which are concerned with principle of abandonment. Section 61 says, Effect of constructive total loss. Where there is a constructive total loss, the assured may either treat the loss as a partial loss or abandon the subject matter insured to the insurer and treat the loss as if it were an actual total loss. What is constructive total loss? Again, a constructive total loss is a loss. Constructive total loss is a loss in which the cost of retrieval of the goods exceeds the value of the goods when uh, they are retrieved. So, uh, for a uh, if the insured wants to uh, invoke the constructive total loss provision, he must abandon the property to the insurance company. If the insured is not abandoning the uh, property to the insurance company, he cannot claim the uh, constructive total loss, but he is only eligible for the uh, partial loss. Now, section 62, notice of abandonment. Subject to the provisions of this section, where the assured elects to abandon the subject matter insured to the insurer, he must give notice of abandonment. If he, if he fails to do so, the loss can only be treated as partial loss. 
notice of abandonment may uh, may be given in the writing or by word of mouth or uh, partly in writing or partly by word of mouth so notice of abandonment can be given in right either in writing or orally as well now where the notice of abandonment is properly given the rights of the assured are not prejudiced by the fact that the insurer refused to accept the uh, abandonment if the insurance company does not accept the notice of abandonment that doesn't mean the rights of the insured uh, insured are prejudiced under the policy of uh, under the insurance policy the insured can still claim uh, the loss as partial losses however where the notice of abandonment is accepted, the abandonment is irrevocable. If the insurance company accepts the notice, then subsequently he cannot uh, disclaim the liability. The accept of uh, notice of abandonment is irrevocable. Again, the acceptance of the notice conclusively admits the liability. Once you accept the notice of abandonment, that means you have admitted your liability. The claim is payable on constructive total loss basis. That's it. Subsequently, after acceptance of notice of abandonment, the insurance company cannot take the ground that, oh, there is a breach of this warranty or the a breach of these terms and conditions, or there is this exclusion which is, uh, which is uh, uh, applicable. No, these grounds are not uh, available with the insurance company. If he has accepted the uh, notice, then he has admitted the liability. Okay, so uh, therefore. Uh, in general, in practice, the insurance company uh, does not accept the notice and uh, they does not even acknowledge the receipt of notice that the insured, the insured has given us such and such notice for abandonment. Okay. What happens is as soon as you receive the notice of abandonment, you appoint a surveyor uh, who does, the surveyor goes to the uh, place. Uh, where the goods are available and he will make the discrete inquiry about the goods that what is the current position what is uh, what what is the condition of the goods what are the uh, estimated salvage value or the sale proceed which are uh, uh, which are to be uh, accounted for the insurance company and most importantly what are the liabilities associated uh, with those goods so only after uh, all these points are cleared, the insurance company will accept the notice of abandonment. Now, how the principle of subrogation is different from principle of abandonment. So under the principle of subrogation, all the rights and remedies of the insured against any negligent third party is transferred to the insurance company. Only the rights and remedies of the insured against any negligent third party who could be port authority or uh, carrier or shipping line, any it could be anybody. So all the rights and remedies of the insured against any negligent third party is transferred to the insure, uh, insurance company. However, in the case of principle of abandonment, the title of the goods passes to the insurer. That means the insurance company becomes the owner of the goods the title of the goods passes to the insurance company. In, under the principle of subrogation, the insurance company can recover from the negligent third party only up to the amount of claim paid to the insured. Any amount recovered in excess of claim amount, claim amount paid must be transferred to the insured. That means uh, under the principle of subrogation, if you have, uh, if, uh, you have paid uh, a claim amount of rupees 100, and uh, under the under your right of subrogation, you have recovered an amount of rupees, say 120 from carrier. Okay, so in that case, you can uh, keep only rupees 100 uh, with you, and the excess uh, amount recovered, that is rupees 20, has to be transferred to the insured. So under the principle of subrogation, you have a right to recover the amount only up to the amount that you have paid as a claim okay however under the principle of abandonment because you have become owner of the goods now the goods are under your ownership the insurer can recover any amount from the negligent party even in excess of the claim amount paid 
Under principle of subrogation, only rights and remedies of the insured against any third party is transferred to the insurer and not any liability attached there. So if uh, uh, there is any liability, for example, you have paid claim for a hazardous cargo, okay. And uh, there is pollution liability or the, uh, there are some third party damages or injury or diseases which uh, which uh, which were occurred due to uh, damage to those, uh, those hazardous cargo. So those liabilities will not be imposed on you as an insurer under principle of subrogation. Only rights and remedies will be transferred to uh, the insurance company. However, under principle of abandonment, again, since you are the owner of the goods, all the liabilities associated with the goods will also be transferred to the insurance company. Therefore, in practice, notice of abandonment is not accepted by the insurer unless all the relevant information pertaining to, pertaining to the goods are available to the insurer. In general, the insurer does not even acknowledge the receipt of notice of abandonment. Okay. Now, principle of proximate cause. So, so we are not discussing that principle because there is literally no change from other lines of business. You already know what is the principle of proximate cause. So any questions regarding uh, principle of marine insurance and their relevance to marine insurance act? Yes, yes. Okay. So I guess we'll take uh, 10 minutes of break and we'll resume on 12.15. Okay? Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, oh, thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon, all of you. Should we resume the class? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. I will look at the uh, various coverages available in marine cargo insurance policy. So marine cargo insurance being international in nature to bring uniformity in coverages offered worldwide, Institute of London Underwriter introduced first uh, set of cargo insurance that is Car Institute Cargo Clauses A, B and C, 1982. We all know that um, Marine cargo insurance is international in nature. There are uh, international transit between two countries and the rules, regulations, market practices of insurance markets in uh, two different countries will always be different. So to bring uniformity and to facilitate the international trade, uh, in Institute of London Underwriters introduced a first set of cargo clauses those were Institute Cargo Clauses A, B, and C, 1982. Uh, now, why they are called Institute Clauses? Because they were introduced by Institute of London Underwriters. These three clauses, A, B, and C, are applicable for C mode of transit. They are not applicable for air mode of transit. Secondly, these three clauses, are relevant for general cargo because they uh, address they address the issues or perils maritime perils concerned with general cargo only so if your cargo is of any specific nature if uh, there are some potential hazards of peculiar nature which are not covered in icc a b and c these three clauses will not be beneficial to you. ICC B and C being named peril cover and ICC A is a all risk cover. So ICC B and C, these are named peril clauses or named peril covers. That means only perils mentioned in these clauses the coverage will be subject to perils mentioned in these clauses, obviously subject to exclusion mentioned. So uh, under a new peril insurance policy, only the perils mentioned are covered uh, along with exclusion thereof. However, under an uh, all risk policy, anything which is not excluded is covered. Okay, this is the uh, one big difference. What is the other difference between a named peril policy and an all risk policy? What is the major difference apart from this one? So under a named peril policy, the onus of proving that one of the named peril has uh, occurred or operated is on the insured. The insured has to prove that look, these are one, two, three, four, five. These are the five perils which are covered in my policy. And this particular uh, peril number three has been operated during this incident and the, which has resulted into loss. So the onus of proving which peril has operated is on the insured. However, under uh, an all risk policy, there is no such onus on the insured. As long as insured can prove that none of the exclusion has uh, operated. Insured has to prove only one thing that look, your policy excludes these 10 things, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These are the 10 perils which are excluded in your policy. And none of these peril has operated. So my claim is payable under the policy. Irrespective of which peril has operated and I'm failed to prove that which, which was the exact peril which has operated, which has led to loss to my cargo. There is no such uh, onus on insured under all risk policy. These are draft clauses and the insurer are free to make any changes in these clauses as per their requirements. 
so there is no compulsion that you have to use icca as it is these are draft specimen uh, drafted by ilu and you can make any number of changes okay you can add n number of exclusions you can add n number of coverages these clauses were more relevant for cargo of general nature subsequently various commodity clauses to suit the requirement of a particular commodity were also introduced by ilu uh, these are institute coal clauses institute bulk oil clause frozen food clause jute clause nature uh, nature clause etc so these are the clauses or uh, i would say these are the commodities which are vulnerable to some uh, peculiar uh, hazards or perils which are not covered under icc a b or c for example institute coal clauses the coal uh, coal is uh, susceptible to uh, spontaneous combustion okay now spontaneous combustion is excluded by virtue of general exclusion number 4.4 .4 of icc a b and c what does 4.4 .4 says it says that uh, loss or damage due to inherent vice or nature of subject matter insured is excluded now spontaneous combustion is a inherent vice property of coal so a person who is engaged in trading of coal is much concerned with uh, peril of uh, uh, spontaneous combustion rather than other perils for example wet damages or any other perils okay so if he opt for icc uh, a b or c peril uh, i mean uh, those clauses will not be uh, much beneficial to him because uh, those clauses exclude spontaneous combustion so the institute coal clauses were uh, introduced uh, which uh, which covers the um, peril of spontaneous combustion again uh, we have frozen food clauses so we all know that frozen foods are being shipped uh, in the refrigerated containers they are also called reefers so when the frozen foods are shipped in the re uh, in the reefer and if there is a breakdown of machinery, uh, refrigerating machinery of a container, the refer container, and uh, due to breakdown of machinery, the temperature is not maintained inside the refrigerate, uh, refrigerated container, and there is a damage to cargo. Okay, so that is also not covered by virtue of exclusion for general exclusion 4.4 of ICC, A, B, and C. So to uh, suit the requirement of frozen food, we have introduced frozen food clause. Later on in 1998, ILU merged with DIRMA, that is London International Insurance and Reinsurance Market Association and International Underwriting Association was formed. The second set of institute cargo clauses, A, B and C uh, was introduced in 2009. As on date, around 480 clauses are drafted by I IUA for marine insurance LOB. There are more than 480 uh, clauses. There are versions of same clauses. You will find versions of institute replacement clauses, three versions of institute replacement clauses. Uh, you will find two, uh, two or three version of institute classification clauses. So uh, these are the versions which were, uh, you know, the latest uh, one being more improved because the institute has felt the uh, requirement of making changes, necessary changes in those clauses, depending upon the uh, issues uh, faced by the maritime fraternity. So the, uh, this was the uh, brief introduction of institute cargo clauses. So there are total 19 clauses in ICC A, B, and C. The first clause being risk covered, clause number one. By the way, you are not supposed to remember all these uh, numbers that uh, each number of clause uh, covered uh, uh, or address which issue. You are not supposed to remember all these nonsense. Number one is risk covered. So, second clause is general average and salvage charges clause. The third clause is boat to blame collision liability clause. Fourth is general exclusion. Unseaworthiness, unfitness exclusion is number five. War exclusion is number six. Seven is strike exclusions. Then we have transit clause, termination of contract of carriage clause, change of voyage clause, insurable interest, forwarding charges, constructive total loss, increased value insurance. So, 
we have total 19 number of clauses in each of these clauses, that is ICC A, B, and C. Now we look at them in detail. Risk covered clause one under ICC C. This insurance covers except as excluded by the provisions of 4, 5, 6 and 7 below. Now what is 4, 5, 6 and 7 below? Again, please uh, look at here. 4 is general exclusion, 5 is unseaworthiness or unfitness exclusion, 6 is war exclusion, 7 is strike exclusion. So this insurance cover except as excluded by the provisions of clause 4, 5, 6, 7. These are the perils which are covered under ICC C. Loss or damage uh, to subject matter insured reasonably attributable to fire or explosion, vessel or uh, craft being stranded, grounded, sunk or capsized, overturning or derailment of late land conveyance, collision or contact of vessel, craft or conveyance with any other external object other than water, discharge of cargo at a port of distress. Okay, now again, loss of or damage to subject matter insured reasonably attributable to these perils. And what is discharge of cargo at a port of distress? Port of distress is any port short of port of destination. It could be any intermediate port, but it should not be port or destination. So any intermediate port, which is short of port of destination, where the transit is terminated, where the transit is terminated, due to operation of any maritime peril is considered as discharge of cargo at a port of distress. Now, how this peril operates, we will uh, look at this later on because uh, to understand this peril, you must be conversant with the uh, concept of forwarding charges, which is clause number 12. So, we will first understand uh, what is forwarding charges and then we will come back here to understand uh, how this peril actually take place. Okay, now I'll ask all of you a question and uh, uh, I would love to hear your opinion in this regard. So here is the hypothetical scenario. Okay, uh, there are two types of goods on a vessel, A and B. Okay, there is a fire in goods A. You are the owner of goods B. I'm repeating, there is a fire in goods A. You are the owner of goods B. Okay, now there is water spraying to extinguish that fire in goods A. Now that water comes to goods B and damage your goods B. Okay, your, I repeat, your goods are not damaged directly by a fire, but your goods are damaged by water used to douse the fire. Whether the claim is payable under ICC C or not. Whether this claim is payable under ICCC or not? Payable. Anyone else? Not payable, sir. Who says not payable? Sir, myself, Naresh. Naresh, Naresh ji, huh? Ji, sir, why it is not payable? Because it is directly not uh, affected exactly. by the fire. Yes, it is not. Uh, it is not directly. Uh, caused by the fire, but it is reasonably attributable to fire. That's why the claim is payable. Okay. okay. This okay, is sir. reasonably re attributable to fire because had there been no fire at this, that place, water would not have been there to damage goods B. Am I correct? Okay. Okay, sir. So, yes, the loss is not caused directly due to fire, but yeah, the loss can be reasonably attributable to fire because the water was there just to douse the fire. And that's why although there is no loss or damage due to uh, rainwater or fresh water in ICCC, this claim is uh, again payable. Now I'll give another example. Suppose... Sir, I have one doubt. Haji, Haji, yes. Sir, uh, in this example, Huh. We can uh, say uh, whether we can say that the uh, the dowsing of fire huh. is uh, court uh, uh, can be covered under general leverage sacrifice. I mean that uh, the water is spread to uh, 
I I did not say I did not say that the fire is endangering the entire adventure. Okay, for a general average act to take okay. place, the entire adventure has to be in danger. Okay, sir. Okay, there okay. is there is fire to only to cargo A. Only goods A okay. were were okay. endangered. Okay. 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 Thank you. Now again another example. Suppose the vessel uh, collides with some object other than water, and there is hole in the hull of the uh, hull of the vessel. Okay. Now the sea water enters through that hole and damages the goods inside the hold of the vessel. Whether this claim is payable to under ICC C or not? So please repeat the question again. there is collision of a vessel with uh, external object other than water okay and there is a hole on the hull of the vessel and the sea water enters through that hole and damages the goods inside the hold of the vessel okay so whether the loss is payable under iccc or not uh, no sir not payable anyone else yes sir payable 1.1.4 yes it is payable, payable because the entry of sea water is reasonably attributable to collision okay the sea water has not entered uh, without any any of uh, operation of any of these peril sir, sir had there been a, a water damage uh, due to rain then uh, it would not have been payable no no because it it will there has to be there has to be some sort of casual relationship between these one of these peril okay one of these five peril and the ultimate peril which has caused the loss okay even if there is rain water yes if the rain water enters through that hole which which was created by collision then the claim is payable that surveyor has to confirm correct so there has to be some sort of casual relationship between one of these five peril and the actual peril which has resulted into the loss okay nareesh ji okay sir okay thank you sir okay this uh, this peril we will uh, discuss later on discharge of cargo at port of distress now loss of or damage to the subject matter insured caused by general every sacrifice and jettison we will discuss is uh, discuss uh, these perils later on because uh, we have to look at the definition of general average and jettisoning okay now icc b perils this insurance covers except as excluded by the provisions of clause 4 5 6 and 7 below now 1.1.1 to 1.15 they are identical to icc c there is one additional peril that is earthquake volcanic eruption or lightning again this clause says loss or damage to the subject matter insured reasonably attributable to so even if the ultimate loss is not directly caused by one of the uh, enumerated perils if you can reasonably attribute the loss to those perils the claim is very much payable okay loss of or damage to subject matter insured caused by general every sacrifice uh, jettison or washing overboard we will look at these perils later on entry of sea lake or river water into vessel craft hold conveyance container or place of storage only entry of sea lake or river water is permissible loss or damage due to fresh water and rain water is not payable under icc b only entry of sea water uh, sea water lake water river water are payable now this peril 1.3 is called sling losses what are the sling losses total loss of any package lost overboard or dropped whilst loading onto or unloading from vessel or craft now this is very uh, Uh, confusing peril first of all there has to be total loss so the partial loss are not payable there has to be total loss of any package which are lost on board or dropped whilst loading or to or unloading from vessel or craft only so if there is a total loss of any package uh, whilst loading on to or unloading from a truck then the claim is payable or not under iccb the claim is not payable okay 
there has to be total loss whilst loading into or unloading from vessel or craft only. Any doubts? It had to be sea vessel or sea craft. Sorry? It had to be a sea vessel, I mean, not a land vessel. Yes, yes. These all three clauses, I see B and A, B and C are for C mode of transit only. Okay. So whenever we are referring to any mode of conveyance, uh, uh, it is uh, primarily it is uh, C mode of conveyance. Okay. 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 ICC A. The insuring clause or risk covered clause of ICC is the simplest. It says anything uh, which is not excluded by virtue of clause 4, 5, 6 and 7 is covered. It is as simple as that being all risk in nature. Now, general average. <clears throat> what is general average? What is the definition? What is the uh, practical and mo uh, most popular definition of general average? We will look at that definition first and then we will look at the legal definition of general average as defined under Marine Insurance Act 1963. Okay. General average and ancient principle of equity recognized by maritime uh, nations predating the concept of insurance. That means even when the insurance was not there, the concept of general average was still there and it is still valid today. In which all parties involved in the sea adventure, we, uh, we, uh, what could be those parties? So it could be vessel, cargo and freight. Freight means if your vessel is under charter party agreement, that means owner of the vessel is different and uh, management of uh, vessel or you can say operator of the vessel is different. So in that case, vessel owner will be different and uh, freight owner will be different. So all these party proportionately share the losses from voluntary and successful effort to save the entire venture from an imminent peril. There are two types of general average acts. It could be general average sacrifice and general average contribution. General average sacrifice is sacrifice or jettisoning of cargo or property of a vessel. And general average contribution means extraordinary contribution or expenses incurred for the benefit of vessel and cargo. Clear? So for general average to take place, yes, Nareesh ji. Clear, sir, clear. Okay. Uh, for a general average act to take place, there has to be more than one party, first of all. Second thing, uh, there, the act of general average must be voluntary and extraordinary in nature. Third thing is, uh, it should have taken place for uh, common interest of entire adventure, for, for common interest of all the parties or all the interest involved. And it must result into a successful effort. These are the four important points. It must result into successful effort. Even after sacrificing everything or uh, even after, you know, incurring all the expenses, if the efforts are unsuccessful, the general average cannot be declared. Okay. For a general average act to be declared, there has to be some safe parties. What is jettisoning? Jettisoning means deliberate or voluntary throwing overboard of cargo or ship's superstructure, equipment or stores to protect other property from a common peril. Cargo or vessel's property can be jettisoned to lighten the vessel, to stabilize, uh, to stabilize it during a storm or to get rid of flammable or explosive during a fire. So this is the act of jettisoning. It is deliberate and voluntary throwing overboard of cargo or ships superstructure or equipment or stores to protect the entire adventure from a common peril. This is jettisoning. This, these are the common definition, uh, most popular definition or practical definition. Now we look at the legal definition of general average. What is general average? So this is the clause two, general average clause, clause two of ICC, A, B and C. It is common in all the three clauses, A, B, and C. 
This, ins this insurance covers general average and salvage charges adjusted or determined according to the contract of carriage and or governing law and practice incurred in avoid uh, incurred to avoid or in connection with the avoidance of loss from any cause except those excluded in clause 4 5 6 and 7 below what is the uh, definition of general average loss so a general average loss is a loss caused by or directly consequential on a general average act. It includes general average expenditure as well as general, general average sacrifice. Now, this is the legal definition of general average. There is a general average act where any extraordinary sacrifice or expenditure is voluntary and reasonably made or incurred in time of peril for the purpose of preserving the property in peril in common adventure. This is the exact legal definition of general average. Where there is a general average loss, the party on whom it falls, uh, uh, the party whose goods were sacrificed or jettisoned, okay, that party is entitled, subject to conditions imposed by maritime law, to a rateable contribution from the other parties interested, and such contribution is called general average contribution. So, if my goods were jettisoned or sacrificed, during a general average act and uh, uh, I uh, and the entire common adventure has been uh, uh, successful or saved by that uh, act of sacrifice or ex, uh, jettisoning, then I am entitled to receive retable proportion from the other parties whose goods were uh, saved by act of general average. So they are contributing towards my loss as per the principle of general average. So their contribution towards uh, for compensating my loss, my loss is considered as general average contribution. This is considered as general average contribution. And the thing is, general average uh, will be imposed on each and every party involved, including that party whose cargo is jettisoned or uh, sacrificed. So we will look at the example. Now, this is the example. There are two, uh, there are 10 interest on a vessel. Okay. So total 10 interest, including vessel owner and charterer and cargo owner, everything. There are total 10 interest, say A to J. Cargo of A worth of rupees 10 lakh was jettisoned to safeguard the common adventure from a maritime peril. So there was jettisoning of 10 lakhs uh, uh, rupees worth of cargo of uh, cargo A and it was uh, the entire adventure was saved by this uh, act of jettisoning. Now this extraordinary sacrifice of rupees 10 lakhs will be apportioned on all 10 parties interest involved including A, including A himself whose cargo was jettisoned. So remaining nine parties will make contribution to A of rupees 1 lakh each. So parties B to J, these nine parties will make contribution of rupees 1 lakh to A. So A will receive total rupees 9 lakhs from other remaining nine parties and uh, he will also bear rupees 1 lakh himself. So now for A, uh, whose cargo was jettisoned, that loss of rupees 1 lakh is considered as general average sacrifice. This is the important point. For A, whose cargo was jettisoned, his loss of rupees 1 lakh because his, uh, his cargo's worth was rupees 10 lakhs and he has received only rupees 9 lakhs from 9 other parties. So his loss of rupees 1 lakh is considered as general average sacrifice. And uh, A can claim this rupees 1 lakh from his insurer under clause 1.2.1 of general average sacrifice. Now you must have got this uh, uh, point clear, correct? General average sacrifice. Clear, sir, clear. Sir, one question, sir. Yes, yes. Sir, so in that case, the remaining nine people who are the nine... Uh, Yes, for insured, remaining, they, ha, yes. Yeah, they can claim from their respective insurance. Yes, yes, yes. For right? remaining yeah, nine okay. parties, yes. Yeah, look, at, okay. look at this paragraph. For remaining nine parties' interest, that is from B to G. 
whose ga- whose goods are intact whose cargo are not damaged during the transit but they have contributed towards loss of a okay so they can claim that general average uh, contribution of rupees 1 lakh from their uh, insurer but under clause 2 clear sir thank you thank you ha because the risk covered clause clause 1 only covers uh, only covers uh, loss of or damage to cargo so the remaining party can claim uh, under clause 2 now we'll get back to this peril this remaining peril jettisoning what is the need of incorporating this peril explicitly that the loss of or damage to subject matter insured caused by jettisoning is covered when you have general average sacrifice already covered under the policy what is the need for mentioning it explicitly so the the reason is for a general average act to take place there has to be more than one parties okay general average act cannot be uh, uh, apply, uh, applied when there is only one interest is involved there has to be more than one interest two or more interest for application of general average principle okay so what if the vessel owner himself is carrying his own cargo in uh, in in a maritime adventure so there is only one party involved in this entire adventure vessel owner himself and the cargo belongs to vessel owner uh, itself okay so there is no any other second party involved in this maritime adventure so general average act cannot be declared even if there is sacrifice of extraordinary nature to uh, safeguard the entire uh, adventure there uh, there is no any other party involved so you cannot uh, declare the general average so in that case if the insured has jettisoned uh, his his cargo to save the adventure this will be payable under iccc now these two uh, perils are clear i, I guess okay. yes sir yes sir uh, uh, so this is general average these are the uh, provisions of uh, marine insurance act 1963 regarding general average subject to any express provision in the policy where the assured has incurred a general average or expenditure he may recover from the insurer in respect of proportion of the loss which falls upon him and in the case of a general average sacrifice he may recover from the insurer in respect of whole loss without having enforced his right of contribution from the other parties liable to contribute now i'll ask you one again, again uh, we will look at this um, provision of clause 2 general average this is identical in all three clauses icc a b and c this insurance cover general average and salvage charges adjusted or determined according to the contract of carriage and or governing law and pr- uh, practice incurred to avoid or in connection with the avoidance of loss from any cause except those excluded Uh, in clauses four, five, six, and seven, I'm repeating this clause is identical in all the three ABC clauses. Now my question is, your cargo is insured under ICC C peril. Okay, now uh, you have uh, been imposed with a liability for contribution of general average due to uh, earthquake or volcanic eruption. Again. your cargo is insured under icc c peril and you are liable to pay contribution under this uh, clause to general average uh, a general average act has been caused due to earthquake or volcanic eruption peril whether this uh, general average contribution is payable or not i think no no sir okay anyone else Rona not payable not payable okay this claim is payable 
this claim is payable. I'm again repeating. The goods were covered under ICC and there is general average contribution due to earthquake or volcanic eruption. Okay. There is no loss or damage to cargo of the insured. There is general average clause. Uh, what does it say? Incurred to avoid or in connection with the avoidance of loss from any cause, from any cause, except those excluded under clause 4, 5, 6 and 7 below. If you look at the clause 4, 5, 6 and 7 of ICCC, peril of uh, earthquake or volcanic eruption is not excluded. Again, I'm repeating, clause 4, 5, 6 and 7 of ICCC does not exclude peril of earthquake or volcanic eruption. Yes, the, was there any uh, damage to cargo due to earthquake or volcanic eruption that would not have been payable under ICCC. The loss or damage to cargo due to volcanic eruption would not have been payable under ICCC. But here it is general average contribution and general average contribution due to any peril, not just because of insured peril, due to any peril, except those excluded under 4, 5, 6 and 7. That general average uh, contribution is payable. Clear this point? Yes, sir. Now clear, sir. Yes, yes sir. Okay. Okay. Because most of the time people are under impression that general average caused by only insured peril is covered. You can say that the general average clause of all the three clauses, A, B and C is actually all risk in nature. Yes. The risk covered clause, the first clause, risk covered clause is named peril in B and C and for A it is all risk. However, the general average clause in all the three uh, clauses, A B, A, B and C is all risk in nature and it excludes only those perils which are mentioned in 4, 5, 6 and 7. Now, this is the definition of salvage charges subject to any express provision in the policy subject uh, subject to any express provision in the policy salvage charges incurred in preventing a loss by a peril insured against may be recovered as a, uh, as a loss by those perils so this is the provision of section 65 subject to any express provision in the policy so if your uh, pro uh, policy has the provision that the salvage charge is incurred by any peril except those excluded by 4, 5, 6 and 7, then this section will be superseded. Okay. Salvage charges means charges recoverable under maritime law um, by a salver independently of contract. They do not include the expenses of services in nature of the salvage rendered by the assured or his agent. So for a salvage charge to incur, it must not be rendered by assured or his agent. There has to be an independent uh, sal a salver, maritime salver under a maritime law. Such expenses where properly incurred may be recovered as per particular charges or a general average loss according to the circumstances under which they were incurred. Now, many of you must have... Uh, read about this incident of ever uh, ever given the shipping uh, line evergreen this is the con uh, container vessel of shipping line evergreen Nam name of the vessel is ever given now it was stranded in the uh, egypt uh, suez canal okay so it was stranded there for almost uh, seven days and uh, salvaging operations were uh, conducted to refloat the vessel. Okay, so this vessel uh, has literally, um, I mean, completely blocked the Suez Canal, and and uh, the international trade uh, worth of rupees uh, worth of sixty billion US dollar came to standstill due to this incident. Okay, now this is the. Uh, scenario. This is the Swiss canal. These are the vessels which are waiting for ever, for ever given to be refloated. Okay. So these are the salvage operations. 
here you can see the dredging operations are going on. We, uh, they are uh, deepening the uh, canal for increasing the draft of the vessel so, so, can, so that the vessel can be uh, refloated. So these are the dredging operations. And these are the tugging operations. These are the tugs. Now tugs are the high power uh, uh, engine uh, vessels. They are uh, used only for salvage purposes. Uh, they are not used for uh, uh, passenger carrying or cargo carrying. They are used only for salvage purpose. So here you can see tugging operations going on. So uh, tugs are pulling this uh, 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 stern of the vessel to refloat it. Now, this entire salvage operation uh, was conducted for almost seven days. So the, this uh, shipping line that is uh, evergreen can impose these salvage charges on all these cargo owners. Look at these uh, containers. So these, uh, so these uh, cargo owners have to honor the claim of uh, shipping line towards general average contribution, or you can say salvage charges, which were incurred by the shipping line. Because any shipping line will not incur even a single penny for their cargo owner. As per COXA Act, that is Carriage of Goods by Sea Act 1925, uh, 1925 uh, the uh, shipping line is not responsible for negligence in maneuvering or negligence in uh, management or operation of the uh, vessel. Okay, so they will imp uh, impose these salary charges on the this cargo owner, and they this cargo owner will honor uh, the uh, award of the average register or admiralty law, and these cargo owner can claim those salvage charges from their respective insurer under clause two. Okay, both to blame collision clause. I'll take uh, two minutes of uh, break. Any question regarding general average or salvage charges or general average sacrifice contribution? No question. Okay. No, sir. Okay. okay. Sir. Now we look at this clause. Board to blame collision clause. This is the most uh, mysterious clause of Institute cargo clauses because uh, it has been hardly explained anywhere that what does this clause actually mean. So we'll first go to the bare reading of this clause. This insurance indemnifies the assured in respect of any risk insured hearing against liability incurred under boat uh, under any boat to blame collision clause in the contract of carriage. In the event of any claim by the carriers under the said clause, the assured agree to notify the insurer who shall have the right at their own cost and expense to defend the assured against such claim. Okay. So what is boot to blame collision clause? So every bill of lading or every charter party agreement will have this boot to blame collision clause. If you have ever uh, uh, see the bill of lading, Please look at the reverse side of the bill of lading. The reverse side of the bill of lading has all the terms and conditions that this bill of lading is subject to Montreal Convention 1999. This will be the uh, liability of the carrier in, in case of any loss or damage to the cargo. Limits of liability will be there. The time limit for uh, lo lodging monetary and claim notice on the carrier will be there. So there will, uh, there will also be both to blame collision clause in bill of lading. 
the clause appears in icc due to the peculiarities of american law governing the liability for collision in usa when both the vessels are to be blamed uh, for a collision they are adjudged equally to blame but cargo owners can recover in full from other vessel for any damage sustained so when you cannot decide due to whose negligence their collision has taken place when it is difficult to decide that uh, vessel a or vessel b was negligent the common maritime practice is both uh, both uh, vessel will be blamed for the collision of course the uh, extent of blame or you can say percentage of liability will be different on both the uh, vessels one vessel may be uh, asked to contribute uh, higher than the other vessels and one uh, vessel's fault may be higher than the other vessel so this is the boat to blame collision clause under bill of lading when two vessels collide due to the sole fa fault of one or both contributing to the collision of course in varying percentage of fault uh, the cargo in one or bo both vessels are damaged lost this clause in bill of lading will come into play now if cargo of one particular uh, person has been damaged due to collision incident what are the remedies available to him their cargo uh, they can claim from their cargo owner uh, cargo insurer sorry they can claim from their cargo insurer they can claim from uh, vessel in which the cargo was carried or they can claim from the vessel owner who contributed to the collision that is the other vessel so he has all three option he can claim from the insurance company he can claim from the owner of the vessel in which it was carried or he can claim from the owner of the vessel which has contributed towards the collision by inserting the boat to blame collision clause each of the vessel owners can recover uh, from the other uh, from the other the losses for cargo in proportion of their percentage of fault or blame this loss payable by each of the vessel owner is in turn recovered from all uh, the cargo owners in respect in their respective vessels in proportion to the value of their cargo before the collision again under the carriage of goods by sea act the vessel owner are not liable for negligence or fault of the a uh, fault of the uh, masters or crew or captain of vessels in maneuvering or operation of the vessel so if there is collision due to uh, negligence of the vessel and there is liability on the vessel the vessel will honor that li that liability but the uh, vessel of uh, the vessel will impose that liability on the ca cargo owner carried by her so we'll uh, understand this Uh, in depth with an example suppose there is a cargo owner it doesn't matter that the cargo is on vessel a or vessel b as we have already seen that the cargo owner has option from uh, claiming from all the, all the three parties he can claim from okay, claim it from insurance company he can claim it from the vessel in in which it was carried and he, he can claim it from the vessel uh, which has collided with the uh, with his vessel so a cargo owner has suffered loss of rupees 1 lakh in consequence of collision between vessel a and b now the cargo owner claims damages from vessel a let us suppose say that the vessel vessel a was the colliding vessel the cargo was on vessel b for for the convenience we are supposing that the cargo was on vessel b and uh, it has suffered loss of rupees 1 lakh in consequence of collision the cargo owner has claimed damages from vessel a now vessel a pays the compensation to the owner for rupees 1 lakh rupees vessel a now proceed against vessel b and the liability is apportioned as follows 40% in favor of vessel a and 60% in favor, favor of vessel b so here after apportionment of liability it has come to our knowledge that the fault of vessel a is only 40% and fault of vessel b is 60% although both are to be blamed for the collision under btbc clause the percentage of fault is varying here so now vessel a, a has already honored the uh, claim of rupees 1 lakh of cargo owner he has already paid rupees 1 lakh to cargo owner okay but 
his fault was only 40%. So what he will do, he will recover 60% of the claim that is 60,000 rupees from vessel B. Therefore, vessel A is eligible to claim rupees 60,000 that is 60% of rupees 1 lakh from vessel B whose fault was higher than vessel A. Vessel B honors the claim of vessel A. Now, vessel B, what vessel B will do? Vessel B will honor the claim of vessel A for rupees 60,000. Again, under Cox Act, carriage of goods by CX 1925 and under Bill of Leading Terms, carrier is not responsible for negligence in navigation and management of the vessel. So what vessel B will do? He will apportion this claim of rupees 60,000 on her cargo owners under BTBC clause. That look, I have incurred liability of rupees 60,000 under boat to blame collision clause of my bill of lading. So I will impose these 60,000 on my cargo owners. So if he has 10 cargo owners who comes to take their, uh, who, who comes to take delivery of uh, his cargo. So what happens? Vessel B will ask each and every cargo owner to pay this uh, rupees 60,000, that is rupees 6,000 each from uh, every cargo owner under boat to blame collision liability. Now these, uh, these cargo owners will honor the claim of uh, vessel P. They will pay rupees 6,000 each to the uh, shipping line and they will get their cargo released from the shipping line. Now these cargo owners can claim those 6,000 rupees from their insurance company under clause 3 that is boat to blame collision clause of ICC A, B and C. Correct? Any doubt? No, sir. So what happens here is that the cargo of these 10 uh, cargo owner, uh, cargo owners, um, the cargoes of these 10 cargo owners is, are not damaged. They are in intact condition. The only thing is they have been imposed with a liability of rupees 6,000 each under boat to blame collision clause of bill of lading. Okay. So they have already honored that liability uh, with the vessel owner. So now they can claim that 6,000 rupees from the insurance company under clause three. General exclusion. So there are seven general exclusion under ICC A, that is 4.1 to 4.7. There are eight general exclusion under ICC B and C, that is 4.1 to 4.8. Additional exclusion being malicious damage. There is additional exclusion of malicious damage under ICC B and C. That exclusion is not available under ICC A, so it is covered. Malicious damage peril is covered under ICC A. In no case uh, shall this insurance cover loss or damage or expenses attributable to willful misconduct of the assured. We all know uh, this exclusion. This does not require any uh, explanation. Ordinary leakage, ordinary loss in weight or volume, ordinary wear and tear of the subject matter insured. These are uninsurable risk. These are inevitable risk, rather I would say. These are inevitable risk. These, uh, these are the losses which are bound to happen. And the purpose of uh, ICC clause is to cover um, accidental losses or uh, unforeseen losses. The purpose of ICC clause, uh, clause is not to cover losses which are inevitable in nature. Now, this one is very important exclusion. Exclusion number 4.3, that is insufficiency or unsuitability of packing. Loss, damage or expenses caused by insufficiency or unsuitability of packing or preparation of the subject matter insured to withstand the ordinary incident uh, incidents of insured transit where such packing or preparation is carried out by the assured or their employees or prior to attachment of this insurance. For the purpose of this clause, packing shall be deemed to include storage inside a container and employees shall not include independent contractor. Now, what was the purpose behind incorporating this exclusion? Purpose behind incorporating this exclusion is to uh, exclude the moral hazard not moral hazard, moral hazard of the insured, that is the uh, carelessness of the insured. 
the insurer should not assume that since I have obtained an insurance policy, I am not supposed to exercise due diligence in my day-to-day uh, -day, um, maritime transactions. No, just by obtaining an insurance policy, he is not relieved from his uh, liability, uh, his obligation of duty, uh, duty to care or his obligation of uh, exercising due diligence. So, the packing must be sufficient enough to withstand the ordinary incident of the insured transit where such packing or preparation is carried out by the assured or their employees or prior to the attachment of this insurance. That means this exclusion is conditional upon. You cannot invoke this exclusion each and every time. For this exclusion to be invoked, there are certain conditions to be complied with. What are those conditions? That the packaging must be done by insured or its employees. Okay. And the uh, packaging or the packaging must have been done prior to the attachment of this insurance. If any of these conditions is uh, complied with, then and then only the insurance company can invoke this exclusion against the insured. So you must have heard these two uh, words, full container load and less than container load, FCL and LCL. What does it mean? So uh, suppose you are an exporter, you want to ship your goods to South Africa, let us say, and you have called a shipping line that I want to ship this much quantity of goods to South Africa. And these are the description of the goods. So the first question this uh, shipping line will ask is whether your goods is full container load or less than container load. That means if you say my goods are full container load, that means the shipping line will send empty container to your premises along with manifested sales. Okay. So you will open the container. You will then all this towing inside the container. You will close the door of the container and you will apply the seal on the container. Those seals will be opened at the final destination by the consignee only. During the entire transit, the container will not be opened at all unless the container itself is damaged. Okay. So in this container, when your bill of lading is showing as full container load, that this consignment is full container load. What do you infer from this word full container load? that the goods inside the container uh, are stored by the insured itself. So yes, in case of a full container load, you can invoke this exclusion. However, when you say the shipping, shipping line that my cargo is less than container load, then in that case, the shipping line will ask you to uh, forward your cargo to the port of loading. And the uh, stowing inside the container will be done by the shipping line. Uh, itself. So in case of less than container load, since shipping, uh, stowing inside a shipping container was not done by the insured, it was done by the shipping line, you cannot invoke this exclusion. Even if there is loss or damage due to in, uh, improper stowing inside a container, since it was less than container load, where stowing inside a container was done by the shipping line, this exclusion cannot be invoked and you have to honor the liability. By the way, uh, packing does not mean the immediate packing of the cargo that is corrugated boxes or bags or drums, etc. The packing also includes stowing inside a container. So uh, stowing inside a container will also be uh, considered as packing. And due to improper storage, if there is a loss, the, uh, the claim is not payable. Any doubt? <coughs> Clear, sir. Okay. Loss 4.4. Uh, loss, damage, or expense is caused by inherent wise or nature of subject matter in short. Again, if there is spontaneous combustion in uh, coal, then the claim is not payable because by virtue of this exclusion, clause 4.4. Many a times you must have uh, come across a scenario of container rain. What is container rain, by the way? Now, in case of container rain, 
both exclusion exclusion 4.3 and 4.4 applies simultaneously so there are cargo of hygroscopic nature for example rice okay so rice is a uh, hygroscopic cargo now what is a hygroscopic uh, what is a hygroscopic cargo so hygroscopic cargo is a cargo which adsorb mo moisture which releases moisture so a cargo which contains moisture and when the cargo is being uh, transported from high tropical area to low tropical area the moisture inside the cargo gets released and that moisture gets condensed on the uh, walls and uh, roof, roof of the container i mean um, in summer when we uh, take out the water bottle from the refrigerator you, you must have observed those droplets outside the surface of bottle so that is called condensation okay the the moisture on the surface of the water bottle gets condensed due to varying temperature so what happens is when you are transporting a consignment of rice from high tropical zone like india to low tropical zone like australia or anywhere else what happens is the uh, temperature inside the container is higher than the uh, temperature of the environment so the cargo uh, releases the moisture that moisture gets condensed on the walls and roofs of the uh, container and that droplets again uh, falls on the cargo and damages the cargo so these are called the uh, condensation losses so here uh, those uh, losses are not payable by virtue of this clause 4.4 as well as 4.3 now uh, some of you might be wondering why 4.3 is invoked here so the thing is while Uh, exporting the hygroscopic cargo which are vulnerable to condensation losses you must put uh, silica gel desiccants bags in, inside the containers so what happens when the cargo releases the moisture those silica gel desiccant bags absorb the cargo uh, absorb the moisture and those uh, and the moisture will not be condensed on the roof and wall of the container and there will be no condensation losses so while exporting hygroscopic cargo one should uh, put the silica gel desiccant bags that means i mean uh, while purchasing electron electronic items online you must have gone through those white uh, small white bags which says do not eat dangerous on so those are silica gel desiccants the purpose of those desiccant bag is to absorb the moisture so in case of condensation losses both 4.3 and 4.4 will be applicable 4.5 delay uh, loss damage or expenses caused by delay even though the delay be caused by risk insured against the loss or damage due to delay is not payable if the car if your cargo is lying at a place for unreasonable uh, amount of time and if the Uh, cargo inside the container gets deteriorated due to delay the, those losses are not payable 4.6 again loss damage or expenses caused by insolvency or financial default of the owners managers charterers or operators of the vessel uh, where at the time of loading of the subject matter insured on board the vessel the assured are aware or in the ordinary course of business should be aware that such insolvency or or financial default could prevent the normal prosecution of the voyage this execution uh, this exclusion shall not apply where the contract of insurance has been assigned to the party claiming here under who has brought or agreed to buy subject matter insured in good faith under binding contract so again this exclusion is a conditional exclusion you cannot in invoke this exclusion against the assured if he was not aware of the insolvency or financial default of the owner manager of charters of course uh, assured should have, should have been aware of these uh, financial default in ordinary course of business in that case this exclusion can be invoked for example united bank of uh, india has declared vijay malya as willful defaulter and he has uh, released the notice that kingfisher airlines will be uh, i mean seized the all the aircrafts of the kingfisher airline, airlines will be seized since the vijay malya is declared as a willful defaulter 
Now you have shipped your goods on the uh, aircraft of Kingfisher Airlines, and if your uh, cargo is stuck there, so you cannot uh, say that uh, you cannot take a defense that no, I was not aware of this fact because it's a, a fact of common knowledge, and it, uh, it was a, uh, I mean, uh, he should have known this fact in ordinary course of business. Exclusion 4.7 in ICC B and C, a deliberate damage to or deliberate destruction of the subject matter insured or any part thereof by wrongful act of any person or persons. Again, this is malicious damage exclusion, it does not require any further explanation. It is not applicable in ICC, hence it is covered. Exclusion 4.8 in ICC B and C and exclusion 4.7 in ICC A. Loss, damage, or expenses directly or indirectly caused by or arising uh, from the use of any weapon or uh, device employing atomic or nuclear fission or fusion or other uh, life reaction or radioactive force or matter. So, this is nuclear exclusion. Again, this is being uh, uninsurable in nature because nuclear risks are uh, still not considered as insurable risk. Um, so, uh, this is not covered under ICC close this. Any doubts uh, under general exclusions? Clear, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Unseaworthiness or unfitness exclusions. So what does uh, this exclusion say? The unsee uh, in no case shall this insurance cover loss, damage or expenses arising from unseaworthiness of vessel or craft or unfitness of vessel or craft for sa safe carriage of the subject matter insured, where the assured are privy to such unseaworthiness or unfitness at the time of subject matter insured uh, is loaded there, therein. So if there is any loss due to unseaworthiness of vessel or craft or unfitness of vessel or craft, the losses are not payable if the insured is privy to such unseaworthiness. Second uh, exclusion is unfitness of container or conveyance for safe carriage of the subject matter insured, where loading therein or thereon is carried out prior to the attachment of this insurance or by the assured or their employees, and they are privy to such unfitness at the time of loading. Now I get a frequent query that uh, there is overloading of uh, overloading of uh, uh, vehicle. And due to their overloading, the vehicle gets top, uh, toppled over and the, there is loss uh, to the cargo. How should we repudiate this claim? Because as per IDA regulations, uh, while drafting the repudiation letter, we are, we are supposed to citing the specific exclusion or specific terms and conditions of the policy that by virtue of this exclusion or terms and conditions of the policy, your claim is not tenable under the policy. So how can we repudiate the uh, losses of overloading of carrying vehicle since there is no any explicit exclusion of overloading. So you can repudiate those claims under this clause 5.1.2 because the conveyance for no, uh, was not fit for carriage of the cargo. If the cargo was say suppose of 20,000 kilogram and the carrying capacity of the vehicle was 10,000 kilogram or 15,000 kilogram. So that means the, the conveyance was unfit for safe carriage of the subject matter insured. And if the assured is privy to such unfitness, so if the vessel, uh, if the vehicle was uh, uh, forwarded to the assured's premises and the loading inside the vehicle was done by the insured's employees, that means the insured was privy to such unfitness that the carrying capacity of the vehicle is only 15,000 kilogram and I'm loading 20,000 or 25,000 kilogram of goods on this vehicle. So the, the vehicle is unfit for a safe carriage of the goods. So in that case, the insured will be considered as privy to such unfitness. And if there is any loss, of course, due to this unfitness, that means if there is overturning of the vessel, a vehicle due to overloading, then and then only you can invoke this exclusion. For example, even if there is overloading, the vehicle was uh, standing there in stationary position and if a vehicle comes from behind and if it damages the uh, vehicle, then you cannot invoke this exclusion because 
it has not uh, caused by unfitness of the conveyance. Okay. The insurer uh, waive any breach of implied warranty of seaworthiness of the of the ship or fitness of the ship to carry the subject matter insured to destination. It is at our discretion if we if we want to waive any breach. Now the uh, the war exclusion. Now these are the this uh, this exclusion that is unseaworthiness and unfitness exclusion is identical in all three clauses that is ICC A, B and C. However, the war exclusion is different in ICC A and ICC B and C. Due to these two uh, words, piracy accepted, okay, after the word detainment, you will not find the word piracy accepted after the word deta uh, detainment. It is absent here. So, this is war exclusion so piracy is exclusion to war exclusion. So exclusion in an exclusion make it a covered peril. So piracy becomes a covered peril. So uh, since ICCA is all risk cover and piracy is not excluded under war exclusions, it becomes covered under ICCA. However, piracy is not covered under ICC B and C because these are named peril, uh, named peril. Uh, uh, clauses and even if there was a piracy, a piracy accepted word here, uh, it still would not have been covered under ICC, ICC B and C because piracy is not a named peril. So uh, apart from these two, uh, and the clause is uh, apart from these two words, the clause is identical for I, uh, ICC A, B and C. Now, some of you might be wondering about uh, that one particular line in IC67 book, which says that uh, a pirate who is a writer uh, and who attacks from the shore is covered under uh, strike clauses, institute strike clauses. And it is very confu uh, confusing. I mean, uh, it has not been explained properly. Okay. So what happens is, if you have opted for ICC B cover, and along with ICC B cover, you have also opted for Institute War clauses as well as Institute Strike clauses. So in practical language, the coverage is ICC B plus War and SRCC. So always remember, piracy never happens on shore. Piracy never happens on land. Piracy always happens offshore. Piracy always happens in the water. So when a pirate who is not in the water, who is on shore, who is on land, who is uh, within the port premises, he is no longer a pirate. He becomes a rioter. Correct? So if he is a rioter, uh, the loss or damage caused by him is payable under institute strike clauses. Of course, not under ICCP, but under institute strike clauses. I guess that line is very confusing in IC67 uh, IC book. Any confusion regarding a war clause? No, sir. Okay. Again, I'll ask you one, one more question that what if, okay, uh, there is no coverage regarding piracy under ICCB uh, clause. What if an insured opts for, because this is this is war exclusion. This is this entire is war exclusion. Okay. So what if an insured who has opted for ICCB peril also opts for uh, institute war clauses? In that case, in that case, will the piracy be covered under, uh, under uh, the uh, under the policy or not? That is the question. Okay, this is the war exclusion under ICCB. If the insured opts for institute war clauses along with ICCB, now what does uh, institute war clause say? It says these all uh, exclusions are covered back. So in that case, whether the uh, piracy will be covered under, under the policy or not, we will uh, see later on. 
this is strike clause or strike exclusion sorry in no case shall this insurance cover loss damage or expenses caused by strikers locked out workmen or persons taking part in labor disturbance riots or civil commotion resulting from strikes lockout labor disturbance riots or civil commotions caused by an act of terrorism uh, an act uh, an act of any person acting on behalf of or in connection with any organization which carries out activities directed towards the overthrowing of or influencing by force or violence of any government whether or not legally constituted and caused by any person acting from a political ideological or religious motive these are the strike exclusions and these exclusions can be carved back by incorporation of institute strike clauses now the duration clause, one of the most important clause. What does the duration clause says? Duration clause simply says the uh, when the when the coverage will attach, when will the coverage attach? Uh, when will the coverage uh, suspend? And when when will the coverage will reattach? And when will the coverage will uh, terminate? So this is the crux of transit clause, nothing else. Uh, there is a thumb rule regarding transit clause because it is very exhaustive. I mean, it's almost two page clause. So if you want to understand the entire transit clause in one a simple line, it would be like this, suppose, the cargo is being transported from point A to point B. From point A to point B. There will be reshipment, there will be transshipment, there will be storage at the place of port, there will be storage at the place of transporter, etc. There will be all sorts of things from point A to point B. During this entire transit from point A to point B, at at any point where the insured controls the transit, the coverage will not be available. It is as simple as that. I'm repeating from point A to point B. During this entire transit, at any point of time, when the insured controls the transit in any manner, the coverage will not be available. And from uh, Point A to point B during the transit, whenever the goods remains, uh, whenever the transit remains beyond the insured's control, the coverage will be available. Whenever the transit remains beyond the insured's control, the coverage will be available. This is the entire crux of this duration clause. Okay. So when, uh, when uh, does the cover attach? The cover will uh, attach. This insurance attaches from the time the subject matter insured is first moved, first moved in the warehouse or at the place of storage for the purpose of immediate loading into carrying vehicle or conveyance for the commencement of transit. Now, this is the biggest difference between uh, Institute Cargo Clauses uh, 1982, uh, 1 January 1982, and Institute Cargo Clauses. Uh, 1st January 2009. This is the biggest difference that is the transit clause. So in under the uh, clauses of 1982, the, uh, the insurance attaches from the time the goods leaves the warehouse. Goods leaves the warehouse uh, of the place of storage. So that means the first or the initial loading in uh, into the carrying vehicle at the time of initial loading or uh, at the time of first loading into the carrying vehicle, the coverage was not at all available. Here, what does it say? That the, when the goods are first move, moved in the warehouse at the uh, or at the place of storage for the purpose of immediate loading into or onto carrying, uh, carrying vehicle or other conveyance for the commencement of transit. So when you uh, move the goods for immediate loading in, uh, into the carrying vehicle, and if any loss or damage happens, the claim is payable since the coverage was in force. Okay, now when does it terminate? So 
it terminates either on completion of unloading. Now, this is also uh, again uh, the big difference between 1982 and 2009 version of clauses. On completion of unloading, that clause used to say after delivery. So that uh, that means. When the uh, uh, vehicle reaches the final warehouse, the, uh, the coverage is uh, not at all available and it terminates at that point. However, here uh, the clause says that on, complete, on completion of unloading from carrying vehicle. So as long as the uh, unloading is not uh, completed, uh, the coverage remains in force. And if any loss or damage happens at the final unloading or uh, final discharge, the loss is payable. On completion of unloading from, uh, from the carrying vehicle or other conveyance in or at any other warehouse or place of storage, whether prior to or at, at the destination named in the contract of insurance, which the assured or their employees elect to use either for storage or other than the ordinary course of transit or for allocation or distribution. Again, that simple principle here, what is happening? The insured is controlling the transit. What the insured is doing, he is uh, using a storage which is not in an uh, ordinary course of transit or he is using a storage for the purpose of allocation or distribution, which the assured or their employees elect to use either for storage other than in ordinary course of transit or for allocation or distribution. So they are uh, controlling the transit. Therefore, no coverage is available and the coverage terminates at that point. When the assured or their employees elect to use any carrying vehicle or other conveyance or any container for storage other than in ordinary course of transit, again, here in this case as well, the insured is controlling the transit. Since uh, he is controlling the transit, the, lo the, loss, uh, the coverage is not at all available. And this is simple 60 days uh, condition after completion of discharge oversight the vessel. 8.2. If after discharge oversight from the overseas uh, vessel at the final port of discharge, but prior to termination of this insurance, the subject matter insured is to be forwarded to a destination other than to which it is insured. The insurer, whilst remaining subject to termination as provided uh, in uh, 1 to 4, uh, shall not extend beyond the time subject matter insured is first moved for the purpose of commencement of transit to such other destination. So what ha happens here is, for example, you are importing one cargo, one consignment uh, from Australia. The cargo was uh, unloaded from the arriving vessel at GNPT port Navashiva. Now, after unloading, as the clause 8.1.4 says, it will, the coverage will remain in force for 60 days after completion of discharge or completion of unloading. It will remain in force for 60 days. Now, what happens is after 10 days, the cargo was originally destined to Delhi. It was supposed to be forwarded to Delhi after uh, unloading at GNPT port. But instead of uh, forwarding, uh, forwarding it to Delhi. Now the insured is forwarding it to Bangalore. Focus on this phrase, a destination other than to which it is insured. So now the insured is forwarding the cargo instead of Delhi, they, uh, they are forwarding the cargo to Bangalore. So the insurance will terminate once the goods are first moved in the uh, place of uh, port for commencement of transit to Bangalore. Got it? The co coverage will terminate when the goods are first moved for commencement of transit to Bangalore, not to Delhi, because here the destination has been changed. So the insured cannot say that the, there, there is only uh, 10 days of duration uh, after completion of discharge from the overseas vessel. And I still have 50 days of coverage left according to the provision of 8.1.4. No, the insured cannot take such ground because there is change of destination. And although uh, 
the duration clause is not exhausted completely as soon as the insured moved the goods at the uh, port premises uh, for forwarding it to other destination the coverage terminates this insurance shall remain now again this is uh, this confirms our thumb rule uh, clause 8.3 confirms our thumb rule this insurance shall remain in force subject to termination as provided for in clause 8.1.1 to 8.1.4 during delay beyond the control of the assured during any deviation forced discharge reshipment transshipment during any variation of adventure arising from the exercise of a liberty granted to carriers under the contract of carriage okay so our thumb rule says as long as the goods or the transit remains beyond the assured's control the coverage is available to the insured so if the goods are uh, being stored at a port premises by the transporter for 10 days 30 days 20 days whatever time that will not be considered as intentional storage that will not be considered as intermediate storage that will be considered as storage incidental to transit and the coverage will remain in force so for this duration clause please uh, remember our thumb rule only uh, so one question was there ha ji ha ji yes sir if that uh, uh, if the buyer sells the goods prior to it reaches to its destination for example it was to reach to delhi so okay. he has sold to a new uh, to another uh, person uh, who is based in bangalore okay so whether that insurance can cover no that uh, that uh, incident has been covered under this 8.2 the goods has to be forwarded to its original destination okay we are changing the destination yeah So if, if you are changing the destination, the yeah, yeah, yeah. as soon so, as the so, goods so. are moved, as soon as the goods are moved, for commencement of transit to that destination, that cover terminates. Okay. Okay. You cannot avail the benefit of those sixty days of uh, period. Uh, period. No, but you if can... the once the insurance company. Ah, uh, that that could be know. another scenario. That could be another scenario. That is the held covered provision. every every clause of marine insurance is always subject to held covered provisions and we have that provision under clause number 9 termination of contract of carriage okay okay ah so this any other doubts regarding uh, duration clause no sir okay now ter termination of contract of carriage if owing to circumstances beyond the control of the assured either the contract of carriage is terminated at a port or place other than the destination named therein or the transit is otherwise terminated before unloading of the subject matter insured as provided for in clause 8 above then this insurance shall also terminate unless prompt notice is given to the insurers prompt notice is given to the insurers and continuation of coverage is requested when this insurer shall remain in force subject to an additional premium if required by the insurer either until the subject matter insured uh, insured is sold or delivered at such port or place or unless otherwise specifically agreed until the expiry of 60 days after the arrival of subject matter insured at such port or place whichever shall first occur now what does this clause says this clause says simply says marine cargo insurance or you can say coverage granted under marine cargo insurance follows the fortune of transit corresponding transit if there is no transit there is no coverage at all simple so if the transit is terminated the coverage also gets terminated and if the insured wants to continue the coverage he has to give notice prompt notice to the insurance company and if the insurance company demands any additional premium he has to pay the additional premium And the coverage can be granted now this coverage this coverage will remain in force uh, till the time the subject matter insured is sold or delivered at such port or place unless otherwise specifically agreed until the expiry of 60 days after arrival of the subject matter insured at such port or place and if the goods are forwarded within 60 days 
the uh, these 60 days if the goods are forwarded to any other destination or uh, sorry destination named in the contract of insurance the coverage will terminate accordance with the clause 8 that we have already seen the transit clause so this is termination of contract of carriage So this is change of voyage. Where after the attachment of this insurance, the destination is changed by the assured. This must be notified promptly to the insurer. Now again, uh, please see this uh, bold and underlined phrase. The destination is changed by the assured. Okay. The destination is changed by the assured. This must be notified promptly to the insurer for rates and terms to be agreed. Should a loss occur prior to such agreement being obtained, cover may be provided, but only if the cover would have been available at a reasonable commercial market rate on the reasonable market term. This, this entire line, should a loss occur prior to such agreement, this entire line is called held covered provision. The, the, pro, the concept or you can say the practice of held cover provision, provision is followed in foreign countries only. We do not follow this practice. The insurance available in India is always subject to provision of 64UB. 64UB, as, uh, uh, as soon as the 64UB is complied with, the coverage is available. So what happens is the foreign insurer also follows the practice of health cover provision. That means they give retrospective coverage uh, after uh, collecting the premium subsequently. I mean, even if at the time of happening of loss or damage, there was no premium paid by the insured, uh, sub uh, by virtue of this health cover provision, they can pay uh, uh, premium later on and they can avail the benefit of coverage from retrospective date, that is from the date of loss. So we do not follow this practice of held cover provision. So it is not important uh, as far as Indian market is concerned. 10.2 says where the subject matter insured commences and transit uh, the transit con contemplated by this insurance in accordance with clause 8.1 but without the knowledge of the assured. Here what it, uh, does it say? The destination is changed by the assured. So here the insured is controlling the transit. The insured has control over the transit because the destination has been changed by the insured. But here, without the knowledge of the insured or their employees, the ship sails to another destination. So here the insured is not controlling the transit. The destination has been changed by the carrier, by the shipping line, not by the insured. This insurance cover, uh, this insurance will uh, nevertheless be deemed to have been attached at the commencement of such transit. That means the insurance will remain in force. The coverage will remain in force. And even if there is change of destination, which was not done by the insured, which was done by the carrier shipping line, the coverage will remain in force. And if any subsequent loss happens, the insurance claim is payable. So these all these uh, three clauses, that is transit clause, termin uh, termination of contract of carriage clause, and change of voyage clause. This follows our thumb rule of marine cargo insurance that at any point of time during the transit, if the insured controls the transit, the coverage is not available. If the cargo remains beyond insured's control, the coverage remains in force. Any doubt regarding these three clauses? No, sir. All clear, sir. No, sir. Okay. No, sir. No, sir. Okay. Now the concept on the clause of insurable interest. There is nothing much to discuss about regarding this clause because we already we already have discussed forwarding charges. Forwarding charges clause clause number twelve. Now, if you remember, we have kept one peril uh, pending for discussion. That was uh, discharge of cargo at port of distress under ICC C clause. We have not discussed that peril. That is 1.1.5. Okay. Now, first we will understand the concept of forwarding charges and we'll uh, look at that peril subsequently. So, where as a result of operation of risk covered by this insurance, 
look at these underlined words where at a result of operation of a risk covered by this insurance the insured transit is terminated at a port or, or place other than to which the subject matter insured is covered under this insurance the insurer will reimburse assured for any extra charges properly and reasonably incurred in unloading storing and for uh, forwarding the subject matter insured to the destination to which it is insured so these are the forwarding charges so if the transit has been terminated at an intermediate port we have already discussed the definition of port of distress any port any intermediate port which is short of the destination port at which the transit is terminated by the carrier uh, due to happening of any maritime peril is considered as a port of distress. So, as a result of operation of a risk covered by this insurance, if the transit is terminated at such port of distress and if any extra charges are incurred, look, in this case, the cargo remains intact. There is no loss or damage to the cargo, but there are extra charges incurred. Charges of uh, which nature? for unloading, storing and forwarding the subject matter insured to the destination to which it is insured. So cargo is an uh, intact, Car the, there is no damage, loss or damage to the cargo, but the insured has incurred these extra charges for uh, unloading, storing and then again forwarding the subject matter insured to the destination. These are considered as forwarding charges and they are payable only if they result uh, as a result of operation of risk covered by this insurance. Now this uh, ICCC peril says, hmm. discharge of cargo at port of distress. So if this peril was not here, forwarding charges are not payable under ICTC and B, correct? Now you all must have understand the reason behind incorporation of this peril under ICCB and ICCC. So if this peril was not there, the uh, forwarding charges would not have been payable under ICCB and C because forwarding charges due to peril insured only are payable. Okay. So we have also discussed forwarding charges. Now, this one is the last clause. Look, uh, we have already discussed that uh, there are 19 clauses uh, under ICC, A, B, and C, but we are not discussing each and every clauses. Uh, those uh, clauses which are not so important from the exam perspective and which uh, those clauses which can be, uh, which can be, uh, you know, we do not require any explanation. Those uh, clauses are not explained here. So this is the last uh, clause that is loss uh, minimizing uh, clause or duty of assured clause. These are also called civil labor charges. What does this clause say? This clause say that it is the duty of the assured and their employee and agent in respect of loss recoverable here under to take such measures as may be reasonable for the purpose of averting or minimizing such loss and to ensure that all rights against carrier, bailies and other third parties are properly preserved and exercised. And the insurers will, in addition to any loss recoverable here under, reimburse the assured for any charges properly and reasonably incurred in purpose of these duties. So, if any of you is working in claims department, you must have noticed that we are insisting for monetary claim notice lodged by the insured on the carrier. And if the insured do not preserve our uh, right of recovery against the carrier, we uh, treat the claim as substandard or non-standard claim due to non-preservation of recovery rights. So by virtue of this clause, that is clause 16.2, 16.2 clause imposes duty on the insured to ensure that uh, all the rights against carriers, bailies and other third parties are properly preserved and exercised. And if he do not adhere to his duty of, uh, of assured under clause 16, 
his claim may be prejudiced. Okay. Second thing, civil labor charges are payable uh, when the insured takes such measures as may be reasonable for the purpose of averting or minimizing such loss. And the insurer will pay in addition to any loss recoverable here under. That also includes total loss claim. So civil labor charges are payable in addition to even a total loss claim. So the insurer will, in addition to any loss recoverable here under, will reimburse the assured for any charges properly and reasonably incurred in pursuance of these duties. Okay. So some of you might be wondering what is the difference between civil labor charges and salvage charges. Okay, and why civil labor charges are payable in addition to any claim, even a total loss claim? Can any of you explain the difference between civil labor charges and salvage charges? Runak? Sir, salvage charges are the expenses incurred towards disposal of the. Hmm. Hmm. This is the definition of salvage charges. Look, these are these are salvage charges. I have already discussed this uh, case, uh, case study. I guess here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. These are the expenses. Look, these are the uh, here. You can see the dredging operation. That is, you are deepening the canal to refloat the vessel. Okay. Here you can see the tucking, oper tucking operation. The cargo are intact. Look at here. The cargoes are intact. There is no loss or damage to the cargoes. Again, what is uh, the definition of salvage charges? So, salvage charges means salvage charges incurred in preventing a loss by perils insured against may be recovered as a loss uh, by those perils. So this is also the charges which are incurred in preventing a loss by peril. Okay. And in duty of assured clause, it says, sorry, it says such measures as may be reasonable for the purpose of averting or minimizing such losses. It's almost the same. So what is the difference between salvage charges and civil labor charges? The major difference is, uh, in case of salvage charges, there are more than one party whose interests are endangered. Okay. And in case of civil labor charges, there is only one party involved whose interest is in danger. This is the first difference. Again, for salvage charges, there has to be more than one party. There has to be, there has to be entire common adventure in danger. Here in the civil labor charge case, the interest of only one person is in danger, not the entire common uh, adventure. This is the first difference. Second, salvage charges are incurred by the shipping line. And he subsequently apportioned these salvage charges on the cargo owners. On the other hand, civil labor charges are incurred by the insured himself. Clear? Salvage charges are incurred yes, by sir. the yes. salvage charges are incurred by the shipping line for uh, for uh, benefit of common adventure for safeguarding the common adventure all the interest in case of duty uh, duty of assured clause or civil labor charges the expenses are incurred by the insured himself. Now, what is the reason behind uh, paying civil labor charges in addition to any claim, even a total loss claim? Because in absence of this, uh, this provision, in, ex in absence of this provision, the insured will not give his full effort to safeguard the, uh, to safeguard his interest. If you, uh, impose a condition that salvage charges are payable only if it uh, this uh, efforts of c1 uh, labor charges result into a successful event in case even after incurring c1 labor charges uh, 
it does not result into a successful effort and uh, the loss still happens only the loss amount will be payable civil labor charges will not be payable okay so the, suppose there is 100 rupees worth of cargo which is endangered and for saving that cargo the insured is supposed to incur 80 rupees of civil labor charges if you have uh, imposed such condition do you really think that the insured will give his 100% to safeguard the uh, to safeguard his interest no he will not do it he will think that even after incurring 80 rupees uh, if there is no successful uh, effort uh, the insurance company will only pay me 100 rupees so those 80 rupees which i have incurred in uh, safeguarding the cargo will, uh, will i have to bear uh, those 80 rupees but by virtue of this clause the insured is uh, i mean relieved uh, from that uh, apprehension that okay even if uh, even after incurring 80 rupees if the, there is total loss the insurance company will pay those 100 rupees as well as these 80 rupees under civil labor charges head okay so here we conclude the icc a b and c clause any doubt under any clause of icc a b and c no sir any question nothing okay Sir, one question was there. Okay, okay, yes, yes. Hello? Yes, yes, please. Yes, uh, sir, uh, we also received a request for uh, risk to be covered while loading and unloading. Okay, so, okay. So, whether okay. this can be covered under uh, any of the ICC? Look, while introducing ICC, A, B, and C clause, I have said that these are draft specimen. Okay. These are not law. These are not rules. These are not regulations. These are draft specimen. And the insurance company can make n number of changes in ICC clauses. If they want to impose any additional ex exclusions apart from those 4.1 to 4.7, if they want to exclude five other perils, they can do so. If they want to include any other peril in ICC B apart from those uh, covered under uh, clause one, they can do so. So if you want to uh, cover loading and loading risk, if you want to cover theft and pilferage uh, risk, if you want to cover uh, malicious damage risk under ICC B clause, there is no restriction or prohibition in this regard. Okay. You can simply cover it by paying additional premium. Okay. Okay. But uh, sir, even though those these being named risk clause, we can cover them at an uh, at an additional rate. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, these are draft clauses. These are not laws that you cannot you cannot make any changes in these okay. clauses. No, you can make n number of changes. I'm telling you, if uh, ICCA has four, only seven general exclusion, I want to add. Uh, six or seven more uh, general exclusion in uh, under clause four, I can do so. I'm at completely liberty to do so. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, should we take 15 minutes of break? Yes, sir. No problem. Okay. Yes, okay. sir. We'll do, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Should we resume? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, okay. So first of all, extremely sorry. I couldn't complete the lecture by 1.30. So um, no issues, but we are we are getting the concept clear. Yes, sir. Okay. So now we will look at the institute work versus. So what is the purpose of institute work clauses? It is simple all those perils which are excluded by virtue of exclusion number six of ICC, A, B, and C. If the issuer wants to carve back those exclusion, he can opt for institute war clauses. Okay. So please read this risk covered clause of institute war clauses. The risk covered clause says, this insurance covers except as excluded by provision of clause three and four below. That is clause three is a general exclusion clause and clause four is a, a unseaworthiness clause exclusion. So the, this insurance covers except as excluded by provision three and four below. Loss of or damage to the subject matter insured caused by war, civil war, revolution, rebellion, insurrection or civil strife arising from or any hostile act by or against belligerent power. Second thing, capture, seizure, arrest, restraint, detainment arising from risk covered under 1.1 above and the consequence thereof or any attempt thereat. Derelict mines, torpedoes, bombs or other derelict weapons of war. Okay, now I had asked you one question that um, we have cleared that thing that uh, piracy is not at all covered under ICCB and ICCC parallel. Okay. Now what if, why piracy is not covered? Because detainment, any kind of detainment was excluded under clause six of ICCB. Now what if an insured opt for institute war clause in conjunction with ICCB clause, in that case, whether the piracy risk will be covered or not? If any one of you can answer me. I'm repeating the question. If an insured opts for institute war clauses in conjunction with ICCB clause, in that case, which also covers detainment. Here you can see the institute war clause also covers detainment. A piracy is a kind of detainment. So in that case, whether the risk the risk of piracy will be covered in the policy or not. Sir, I think it will be covered, sir. Okay. sir technically it should, I, I technically it should, I suppose. Okay, okay, okay. Anyone else? So the answer is it will not be covered. The answer is it will not be covered. So look, these are the integrities of uh, these are the integrities of uh, marine insurance clauses. Okay, here what does it say? Detainment arising from risk covered under one point one above only. That's why I have underlined this phrase. It says detainment arising from risk covered under one point one only. So 1.1, what does 1.1 says? War, civil war, revolution, rebellion, insurrection, or civil strife arising from or any hostile act by, uh, by or against any belligerent power. Detain, if the piracy was mentioned here, yes, detainment by piracy would have been covered. But piracy is not mentioned here. So the simple crux of this clause 1.2 is detaining detainment by only those perils which are mentioned under 1.1 above is covered and piracy is not mentioned that. So even if 
and insured opts for institute work laws in conjunction with ICCB, the piracy will still not be covered under the policy. For piracy peril to be covered under ICCB and ICCC, the insured has to ask the insured to mention it under named perils. Clear? Clear, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Sir. Okay. Second thing. Uh, okay. We'll now go to the exclusion, general exclusion of institute work laws. There are eight exclusion, 3.1 to 3.8 under institute work clause, general exclusion. Remaining seven are identical to institute cargo clause A, ICCA. 4.1 to 4.7. So those are identical. Okay. There is one additional exclusion. That exclusion is any claim based upon loss of or frustration of the voyage or adventure. This is additional exclusion under Institute Work Clause. Okay. So first, I want to clear one concept that the concept of Institute Work Clause as well as Institute Strike Clause. So the, the purpose behind drafting these two clauses, work clauses and strike clauses, is to cover only and only actual physical loss. That's it. The purpose behind drafting institute work clauses and institute strike clauses was to cover only and only actual physical loss. The, the purpose was not to cover any consequential loss which happens due to war and civil, uh, war and strike perils okay so if any expense is incurred if any expense is incurred by virtue of war or strike losses although the cargo remains intact there is no loss or damage to the cargo the cargo remains intact but any uh, subsequent uh, expenses incurred those in, in expenses are not payable either in war clauses or in strike clauses. So here, any claim based upon uh, loss of or frustration of voyage or adventure. Any one of you can please tell me what could be the claim based upon frustration of voyage? What could be the claim based upon frustration of voyage? It will be limited only to the value of the goods only. No, no, you don't. Uh, I guess you didn't get my question. I'm asking you, what could be the kind of losses which could be based upon frustration of voyage or adventure? We have already discussed this. It could be forwarding charges. Yeah. Forwarding charges. Yeah. Forwarding. Clause number twelve. Okay. If the adventure is terminated at port of distress which is short of destination, the expenses necessarily and reasonably incurred for unloading, storing and forwarding it to the destination are payable under forwarding charges. Okay. However, forwarding charges incurred due to war peril, uh, forwarding charges incurred due to war perils are not covered by virtue of this ex exclusion 3.7, any claim based upon loss of or frustration of voyage or adventure. Got it? Okay. Yes, Got sir. It, sir. sir, one question, sir, one question. Yes, yes, yes. So yes, there yes. are also chances of abandonment in this case? There are no charges at all for abandonment. What is the literal meaning of abandonment? You have- No chances, chances of abandonment for in case of a- Achha, sorry, okay. Situation. Okay, okay, okay. There could be, sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, there, are, will there be any chances of abandonment by the owner of the goods in, uh, in a situation like this? Like a yes, yes, bilkul, yes. It's a, it's a wonderful example. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, ha. Abandonment could be considered as first, uh, if the insured uh, abandons the cargo due to frustration of voyage, yes. The claim is not payable. Okay. No. And this again is one of the most important clauses of institute work clauses, transit. When does the cover attach? When does the cover suspend? When does the cover reattach? And when does the cover terminate? 
all of you must have read this uh, transit clause in uh, IC 67 book. And the war clauses, the duration clause of war clauses is a water bond clause. When you say water bond clause, what do you mean is the coverage is available only during the time the car the cargo is water bond. That is the cargo is in the water and not on the land. Okay. So the cover uh, the coverage attaches only as the subject matter insured or uh, and as to any part is loaded on an overseas vessel and terminates either as the subject matter insured and as to any part thereof is discharged from an overseas vessel at, at the final port or port of discharge. Or if the uh, unloading uh, is pending, there is no discharge from the overseas vessel, the cover will remain in force for 15 days, counting from the midnight, from the day of arrival of the vessel at final port. And after expiry of 15 days, the cover will terminate. Okay. Now, what happens if the subject, uh, if there is, uh, there is a case of transshipment? What is transshipment? Transshipment means uh, the goods will not be, uh, be forwarded or the goods will not reach the final destination in the same vessel. There will be an intermediate port, short of destination port, when, uh, where the goods will be discharged from the original vessel and, and then it will be uh, loaded on the other vessel for ongoing journey. So this entire scenario will be called transshipment. In maritime language, it is called transshipment. So what will be the position in case of transshipment? The coverage will remain in force for 15 days. From the midnight of day of arrival of the vessel, as long as the, uh, the cargo is within the port premises only, there will be no coverage uh, as soon as the cargo leaves the port premises. Okay. So this, uh, in the case of transshipment, this is considered as an exemption to the water bond clause. That there is an exemption to the water bond clause that the coverage in respect of uh, war clauses uh, will remain in force even on land in case of transshipment, but as long as the goods are within the port premises only. What happens after 15 days, uh, expiry of 15 days, if, uh, if any one of you can tell me? What happens after expiry of these 15 days? The cover will be suspended, not terminated. The cover will be suspended. The cover will reattach as soon as the go uh, goods become waterborne again. Okay, so when the goods are loaded again in the uh, vessel, the coverage will reattach and it will again terminate as per in accordance with the provisions we have already discussed. Okay, so this is an exemption uh, to the provision of waterborne clause. Any doubts regarding institute war clauses? No, sir. Okay. Okay. So now we'll look at the strike clause. So what does strike clause says? This insurance covers except as excluded by provision of clause three and four below loss of or damage to the subject matter insured caused by strikes, locked out workmen or persons taking part in labor disturbances, riots or civil commotions any act of terrorism or any person acting from a political, ideological or religious motive. So it simply covers all those perils which are excluded by virtue of exclusion 7 of Institute Cargo Clauses, Clause number 7. Okay. This, I guess this does not require any expl further explanation. These are the perils which are excluded uh, under Clause 7 of Institute Cargo Clauses. Now, these are the exclusions. There are 10 general exclusions in institute strike clauses. I'm again repeating, you are not supposed to, you are not supposed to 
रिमेम्बर दीज नंबर ओके थ्री पॉइंट वन एंड थ्री पॉइंट टेन ओके सो देर आर टेन जनरल एक्सक्लूजन इन इंस्टीट्यूट कार्गो क्लोजिज आउट ऑफ विच सेवन आर आइडेंटिकल टू इंस्टीट्यूट कार्गो क्लोजिज ए आईसीसी दे आर आइडेंटिकल टू आईसीसी नाउ वॉट आर द रिमेनिंग थ्री एडिशनल एक्सक्लूजन दीज आर लॉस डेमेज और एक्सपेंसिज अराइजिंग फ्रॉम एबसेंस शॉर्टेज और विथहोल्डिंग ऑफ लेबर और एनी डिस्क्रिप्शन वॉट्स एवर रिजल्टिंग फ्रॉम स्ट्राइक लॉकआउट लेबर डिस्टर्बेंस राइट और सिविल कमोशन सो वॉट इज द डिफरेंस बिटवीन दिस एक्सक्लूजन एंड दिस कवरेज डोंट यू थिंक बोथ आर कॉन्ट्राडिक्ट्री इन क्लॉज नंबर वन ऑफ इंस्टीट्यूट स्ट्राइक लॉजिस इट सेज दैट दिस इज कवर्ड वन पॉइंट वन uh loss or damage to the subject matter insured caused by strike lockout workmen or per persons taking part in labor disturbances or riots or civil commotion now in general ex exclusion number 3.7 it says this this is excluded now these both are almost identical so what is the difference so as i already told you that the purpose behind drafting institute work laws and strike laws was to cover only actual physical damage to the cargo not any subsequent or consequential expenses okay so what happens is uh, let us uh, talk about a hypothetical scenario you have shipped your uh, goods to uh, south africa your goods uh, your goods have reached to jnpt port nawashiva now there is a strike there okay and nobody is uh, ready to load your cargo in the vessel and uh, you are in urgency that you just want to ship uh, those goods to uh, south africa now what happens is since nobody is willing to load the goods on the vessel you have arranged Uh, labor from outside the port premises okay so obviously the labor arranged from outside the port premises will be costlier than the labor available in the port premises and they will charge you more because they know that there is ongoing strike and uh, i can demand uh, any amount from this person because he needs my help in urgency so uh, suppose Hundred rupees of labor is hundred uh, uh, rupees of labor is incurred in case of regular port labors for loading the goods in uh, in the vessel. Since you have arranged uh, labors from outside the premises, they have demanded one hundred and fifty rupees. So you cannot claim that additional fifty rupees. That additional fifty rupees which you have incurred due to absence, shortage, or withholding of labor. because your cargo is still intact there is no loss or damage to your cargo it's only the expenses additional expenses which have been incurred by you by virtue of absence shortage or withholding of labor okay clear this point yes sir okay okay again any claim based upon loss of or frustration of voyage we have already understood this in uh, war clauses loss damage or expenses caused by war civil war this is already a war exclusion it can only be covered under war uh, institute war clauses this cannot be covered under uh, institute strike clauses now institute car clo cargo clauses uh, air i'll take 2 minutes of break please Okay, now look at the institute of cargo clauses there. 
excluding sendings by post. Unlike C mode of transit, where we have three different set of clauses, we do not have that uh, facility here. We have only one clause, that is the institute cargo clauses there, which is all risk in nature. Okay, there are only 17 clauses uh, in institute cargo uh, clause there. Which two clauses are not there? Uh, they have no general average clause and they have no boat to blame collision clause. Why? Because these two particular clauses, that is general average and boat to blame collision, these are the these are maritime principle only. That is, uh, these two uh, principles are uh, concerned with uh, C mode of transit only. They are not applicable for air mode of transit. So uh, there is no general average and boat to blame collision clause. And the transit clause is similar to its counterpart in ICC, A, B, and C, except uh, the duration of the coverage after completion of unloading from the aircraft is for 30 days instead of 60 days in ICC, A, B, and C. Okay. Except all uh, these four points, I guess there is literally no difference between what we have understood in uh, ICC, A, B, and C and uh, uh, ICC uh, air clauses. Okay. Any of you have any doubts regarding uh, Institute Cargo Clauses here? Okay. Institute Classification Clause. I guess we should skip this one. Any doubts regarding Institute Classification Clause? Any of you? Because we are running out of time, that's why. Just give a general view, sir. Okay. So what is the need behind, what is the purpose behind incorporating institute classification clause? This clause safeguards the interest of the insurance company. Because we are, nowadays we are granting uh, blanket policy, that is open policy, open cover, annual sales turnover policy to every term they can have. I mean, these open, uh, these uh, a blanket policy used to be given only to the valued clients, but now we are giving these policies to each and every client. What happens is, we do not know that on which vessel the insured is going to load his cargo. What will be the seaworthiness of that vessel, whether the vessel will be suitable or fit enough uh, for carriage of the cargo or not. So in that case, to safeguard our interest in the policy, we, on, we incorporate this a clause that is institute classification clause. So what does institute classification clause says that the coverage granted in the policy will apply only for the vessels which are complying with the provisions of institute classification clause. If you are loading your cargo on a vessel which is not in compliance with the institute classification clause, no coverage will at all be available to the insured. So what are the provisions of institute classification clause? That a clause, first of all, the, the first clause is qualifying vessel. Which vessel qualifies for the institute classification clause? So a vessel which has been classed by a member or uh, an associate member of International Association of Classification Society, IACS. Okay. There are 10 members of uh, IACS the latest one being IRS, that is Indian Registrar of Shipping, which has been given accreditation of um, a member by ISCS in June 2010. There are multiple associate member. So there are 10 members of ISCS. A vessel must be classified with any of those. Or a national flag society as defined in clause 4 below, but only where the vessel is engaged exclusively in coastal trading of that nation, okay. So what is the coastal trading? So uh, radius of 12 nautical miles from the uh, shore or your port uh, premises is considered as coastal trading. When you uh, exceeds that distance of 12 nautical miles from the port premises, you are now in the international water, okay. So if you are engaged solely in the uh, coastal trading of that nation, 
you are relieved from uh, uh, that re requirement of complying with the IACS classification. However, you must be classified by a National Flake Society. Okay. Now, uh, the vessel has been classified. So, what should be the age of uh, qualifying vessel? The, look, these, uh, some of you might be wondering that these uh, two conditions are, uh, what you can say, uh, alternate to each other. No, they are in addition to each other. So, first you have to see whether the vessel was qualifying vessel or not. Now, if when you are uh, satisfied that the vessel is qualifying, then you will check the qualifying vessel age limit is within this age limit or not. So for bulk or combination carrier over 10 years of age, it should not be over 10 years of age. And for other ves vessels, it should not be 15 years. If the uh, that vessel is a liner, now this is the definition of liner, have been used for carriage of general good, uh, general cargo on an established route a regular pattern of trading between a range of specified ports. So this is the definition of liner. In the chapter of uh, underwriting in IC67 book, you must have uh, gone through the concept of liner and tramp. So this talks about the liner. So if the vessel is liner, it should not be more than 25 years of age. And if the liner is containerized ship or Roro ship, then the age should not be more than 30 years of age. Okay. So this is the concept of institute classification clause. Now we'll look at the types of marine cargo insurance policy. The list is not exhaustive, of course. I have just mentioned the important marine insurance policies, which uh, we are dealing with on day to day basis. Any doubts so far in the lecture? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. Okay. So these are the uh, type of policies we are uh, going to discuss. Specific voyage policy, open policy, Open cover agreement, annual sales turnover policy, annual policy, increased value insurance policy, duty insurance policy, seller's interest, buyer's interest, stock throughput policy. We will uh, discuss in uh, which policy is uh, suitable for which type of transit, which policy is assignable, which policy is not assignable, which policy is valid policy, which policy is not valid policy. We will discuss all those properties of these policies. What is a specific voyage policy? So specific voyage policy is issued for a specific transit. It is not a blanket policy. It is only issued for a specific transit. It's a stamped policy document. The insured is supposed to get approval or he's supposed to negotiate with the insurer before commencement of each and every transit. There is no automatic coverage. Please remember. Unlike in open cargo, uh, open policy or open cover agreement or annual sales term of policy, there is no automatic coverage. The insured has to uh, get each and every uh, transit approved from the insurance company before commencement. It is suitable for both inland transit as well as, well as import export. The policy period is in line with the duration clause incorporated in the policy, although most of the time, the policy period is mentioned as 12 months. In specific voyage policy, you must have seen the period as 12 months in specific voyage policy. It is not 12 months. The policy period is always in line with the duration clause provided in the policy. And we have already discussed the duration clause, clause 8 of ICC ABC. Policy is usually freely assignable unless it is expressly prohibited. The policy is usually freely assignable. The policy is usually valid as well, and the policy is not subject to adjustment clause. There is no provision for refund of premium if the transit does not take place at all. So you cannot claim refund under the policy. The policy is not subject to adjustment clause. This is specific voyage policy.
open policy. Now this is, uh, I mean, uh, this is the most popular policy out of all the policies, open policy. It is a blanket policy. When you say blanket policy, that means that uh, you have taken approval for 12 entire months from the insurance company. And you are not supposed to uh, obtain approval for each and every transit. You have already agreed with terms and conditions of the policy with the insurance company. Okay, so the insured is relieved from arranging insurance before the dispatch of each and every consignment. And the policy period is usually 12 months or till the time some insured gets exhausted by periodical declaration. So if your sum insured has already been exhausted uh, uh, within seven months, you cannot say that the coverage is available for remaining five months. The insured and the insurer agrees for the terms and condition of the policy at the time of issuance of the policies. What could be the uh, what could be those terms and conditions? So these are the terms and conditions that the commodity to be insured. Uh, uh, what will be the commodities which will be insured by the insurance company during those twelve months? Territorial jurisdiction that transit from transit to uh, which are the geographical area uh, uh, excluded or sanctioned areas which are excluded from the policy coverage? What will be the mode of transit? Rail, road, air, sea. What is the sum insured under the policy? What will be the per bottom limit, per location limit? Per bottom limit means the maximum liability of an insurance company per any conveyance, per any conveyance. So uh, if the per bottom limit is rupees 2 crore and the insured has shipped uh, consignment of rupees 3 crore on a vessel, if the, in case of a total loss, in case of a total loss, the liability of the insurance company will be limited to only. Okay. This doesn't mean that in case of partial loss, we will apply under insurance. Some of you might be under impression that if the uh, value of the consignment exceeds per bottom limit, we will apply under insurance in case of partial loss claim. For example, there is the, uh, the per bottom limit is rupees five, uh, 2 crore and the value of consignment uh, is rupees 3 crore. And there is loss of uh, rupees 15 lakhs in the policy. So you cannot apply under insurance and you can say that we will pay only 10 lakhs and for the remaining 5 lakhs rupees, you will be considered as your own insurer. No. You have to honor your liability for the full amount of your per bottom limit. Per location limit means uh, when there is the accumulation of uh, risk beyond a short control. It should not be deliberate. It should, should not be intentional. When there is accumulation of loss, uh, accumulation of risk at one particular place beyond assured control, so up to that limit, the uh, the insurance company will honor their liability. Usually, per location limit is twice the per bottom limit. Not necessary, but usually it is twice the per bottom limit. So the insured and insurance company will also agree for coverage and exclusion, rate of premium. Basis of valuation, because these are valued policies, so basis of valuation will also be agreed upon. Uh, terms, conditions, warranty of the policy, policy access. So these are the conditions which will be agreed upon between the insured and the insurance company before commencement of the risk. After issuance of the policy, the insurer is obliged to accept and the insurer is obliged to declare each and every consignment falling under the scope of the policy coverage. So this is the uh, benefit of a blanket policy. The insurance company, neither insurance company or nor the insured make any selection of risk. The insurance company cannot deny that I am not, I'm not going to uh, accept this uh, consignment. No. If it is falling under the scope of policy coverage, if it is complying with all the terms and conditions, you have to accept the uh, declaration and you have no option of selection. The declaration must explicit, uh, explicitly mention all the relevant particulars pertaining to con consignment dispatch during the concern period. That is invoice number, date number, date, LR uh, number, date, name of consignment, transit from transit to value of consignment, etc. 
so you the insured has to declare each and every dispatch and he has to declare all the relevant particulars pertaining to one particular dispatch to the insurance company if the insured fails to de declare all the consignment falling under the scope of the policy coverage the policy may become voidable he has to declare all the consignment selection of risk is also not permissible for the insured if any consignment has arrived safely or if any consignment has reached safely at his at its destination so, so the insured 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 cannot opt for selection that i am not going to declare it since it has reached safely it will prejudice his subsequent claims some insured under the policy stands reduced by each and every periodical de uh, declarations the insured has option to enhance some insured before it gets exhausted this is a stamped policy this policy is more suitable for co covering inland transit why because uh, in inland transit there is no need for issuance of any marine insurance certificate uh, a transit specific marine insurance certificate there is no such requirement for inland transit so that's why this open policy is more suitable for inland transit the policy is subject to adjustment clause only down, downward adjustment is permissible okay so upward adjustment is not at all permissible because we have already seen that as soon as the sum insured gets exhausted the the policy stands uh, uh, expired so upward adjustment is not permissible which is permissible in many policies in miscellaneous line we have uh, cash in transit policies money insurance policies and uh, section 1 of marine uh, money insurance policies the insurer declares estimated uh, turnover of cash carrying during the policy period so in that case upward the upward adjustment is possible so if he has declared estimated turnover of rupees 1 crore and he has exceeded a turnover of 1 crore 10 lakhs and then loss happens the insurance company cannot deny the liability because there is adjustment clause which permi uh, permits ad adjustment upward as well then there is a condition number 6 of wc policy workman's compensation policy which also allows adjustment of wages on both side upward or downward but here in marine insurance policy adjustment of premium is permissible downward only the policy is uh, usually freely assignable the policy is usually valued policy okay any doubts regarding uh, marine open policy no sir okay thank you open cover agreement how it differs uh, from the open uh, cover policy uh, oh sorry open policy this is an agreement as you already know this is an agreement it is not a policy hence it is not stamped the insured and the insurer agrees for the terms and terms of the agreement at the time of issuance of the policy open cover certificates uh, issued under the open cover agreements are stamped policies open cover agreement itself is not a stamped document or a policy because no consideration or no premium is paid for issuance of open cover agreement however while issuing the open cover certificates we do collect premium from the insured how do we collect premium so the insured maintains a cash deposit or advance premium deposit account the insured maintains cd or epd account with the insurance company for issuance of open cover certificate as and when required after issuance of the agreement the insurer again this is the one of the uh, uh, this is one of the nature of blanket policy that after issuance of agreement the insurer is obliged to accept and the insured is obliged to declare each and every consignment falling under the scope of agreement if the insured fails to declare all the consignment then the policy may become voidable this policy is more suitable for covering import export transit why so because in import export transit you need transit specific insurance policy which explicitly mentions invoice number consignee name bill of lading number transit from transit to commodity description value of the goods uh, 
basis of valuation. Uh, so for export import formalities, the custom department for issuance of either bill of entry in case of imports or shipping bill in case of exports, they do require insurance transit specific insurance certificates. So that's why this open cover agreement is more suitable for import export transit. There is no need for adjustment of premium. So since no consideration was paid by the insured at the time of insurance of uh, agreement, since the insured is simply maintaining a cash deposit or advanced premium deposit account with the insurance company, at the uh, end of the agreement, if the insured uh, does not wish to uh, renew agreement, you can simply make refund of any, any balance available in CD APD account. There is no need for any adjustment. The certificates are usually freely assignable and they are valued as well. Annual sales turnover policy. So, uh, one ah, yes, yes, please, uh, please. So regarding this uh, annual, uh, I'm sorry, the open uh, cover. Uh, yeah, as okay. you said, open policy, we cannot deny any uh, transshipment which is declared. Okay. Okay, but in case of a, a open cover, uh, huh. we will certificate as and when we receive the uh, declaration. declaration. Okay, so but we cannot deny that as well. Okay. After issuance of the agreement, please. Uh, after the, after the issuance time. of the agreement, the insurer is obliged to accept. Okay. The insurer is obliged to accept. And the insured is obliged to declare each and every consignment. Okay. Okay. So, so just uh, for an example, for, uh, for as of now, today, there is a hmm. war situation in uh, uh, Russia. Hmm. So ah, if, okay. If any transshipment is taking place to that, hmm. Hmm. so whether it will be covered? The answer lies whether you have covered transship, uh, transit to Russia under your open cover agreement or not. Because no, the insurer is look, the insurer is obliged to accept only those those uh, consignment which falls under scope of the policy coverage or the, which falls under the scope of agreement coverage. Okay, so if so if the insurer has excluded all the uh, transit exposure to Russia in its original open cover agreement, the insurer is not obliged to accept transit to Russia. Okay. Yes, sir. sir. One one question was that, that uh, this war has started uh, at the time in of between. In between, yes. So in yeah. that case, we receive in that case we receive advisory from General Insurance Corporation GIC Re. Okay. okay. Yeah. So in that case, we send cancellation notice to the insured, right? So that yes, can yes, be yes, yes. We we send. We do not, We cannot outrightly exclude uh, or absolve ourselves from our liability. Okay. So what we, we have to send cancellation notice of uh, say seven days or 15 days as per the advisory of GIC to the, uh, to all the, to all our insured that now onwards in this particular open cover agreement from uh, seven days from date of receipt of this notice war, uh, uh, war cover for a transit to Russia will not be available. So we have to send those cancellation notices. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. 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 Annual sales turnover policy. So, uh, annual sales turnover policy offers widest form of coverage, widest possible form of coverage. Uh, obviously, it is a blanket policy. The insurer usually offer this policy only to the big corporates or reputed clients or clients with favorable claim experience. This policy is not available to each, um, I mean, any client. Uh, the insurer usually offer this policy only to reputed clients. It covers almost, almost all types of transit. What possibly could be the types of transit the, uh, Domestic indigenous purchases, all the domestic purchases can be covered. Uh, all the import purchases, overseas purchases can be covered. Inter depot transfer, job work transfer, 
will be covered. Now, what is inter-depot or job work transfer? We will uh, discuss this in uh, subsequent policy, that is annual policy, which is different from annual sales turnover policy. So, uh, this policy also covers uh, inter-depot transfer or job work transfer. It also covers domestic or indigenous sales. It also covers export sales. All sorts of transfer uh, transits can be uh, uh, covered under annual sales turnover policy. The policy can also cover containers, uh, capital goods. The sum insured under the policy is estimated sales turnover of the insured during the period. That is the sum insured. Although you might be wondering if the uh, purchases are covered, I mean, indigenous as well as import purchases are, are covered. If the uh, inter-depot transfers are covered, why turnover of these three transit are not considered as sum insured? Because the sum insured is, uh, the sum insured is only estimated sales turnover of the insured during the policy period. Because when originally in 2007, uh, when this policy was contemplated by uh, the insurer, the rating pattern also include turnover of these three, these three transit. Rating pattern of annual sales turnover policy uh, used to include uh, turnover of all these transit. And then you arrived at a common rate. There is entire formula that this much is the turnover for uh, domestic purchase, this much is the turnover for uh, import purchase, and this much is the turnover of inter depot transport. And uh, these are the rates. And then you arrived at a premium and you average out that premium rate, uh, average out the premium amount of all five types of transits. You divide it with sales turnover and then you arrive at a premium rate. That's how the premium rate used to be arrived. But now that practice has been done away with no insurer uh, follow that practice. And that's why you can now say that these three types of transits are available literally at free of cost in annual sales turnover policy. None of the insurer in India charges any kind of premium for covering these three types of transit. They are almost available free of cost because the sum insured is estimated sales turnover only. That is these two trans turnover of these two transit only, domestic and export. And the premium is charged on this only. This sales turnover only. So these uh, these three types of transactions are available at free of cost. The insured is supposed to declare only sales amount, domestic as well as export on quarterly basis. The insured is only supposed to declare on uh, sales amount only. On the contrary, uh, you can remember that under open policy, he is supposed to declare all the relevant particulars to each and every dispatches that lorry receipt number invoice number consignment value etc that is not the requirement here he's only supposed to declare sales amount that two on quarterly basis not on monthly basis or fortnightly basis only on quarterly basis if he has uh, done a turnover of say 100 crores he will simply say 100 crore rupees of sales turnover i have achieved during this quarter what were the uh, sales invoices uh, or uh, what were the uh, transit type, uh, no any uh, sort of uh, information is supposed to be di disclosed to the insurance company. The policy is again subject to adjustment clause, only downward adjustment is permissible, we have already discussed this. The premium is charged only on the sales amount declared, okay. The policy is usually freely assignable, this is a valid policy. Any question on annual sales turnover policy? Uh, no, sir. Okay. No, sir. Thank you, thank you. Now we'll look at the annual policy. The least heard about policy. One of the, uh, along with buyer's contingency policy, this is the policy uh, which you might have uh, rarely heard about. Annual policy. This policy is issued for 12 months. This policy is issued for goods which are not under contract of sales. So there is no contract of sale. There is no buyer. There is no seller. The goods are, the ownership of the goods is not changing. 
the goods are only being uh, transited from insured's one premises to insured's other premises so uh, for those type of uh, transits uh, this policy is used or issued therefore by uh, due to this reason this policy is not assignable because there is no contract of sale there is no buyer there is no seller the ownership is not uh, getting changed it remains with one same person so the question of assignment does not arise that's why this policy is not assignable uh, the depot from which the transit commences and at which the transit ends must be owned occupied or hired by the insured there is no need for making any periodical declaration by the insured there is no uh, need for making any declaration the sum insured represents maximum value of goods on risk at any time during the policy period and remains constant in the event of no claim so what happens is i have four factory outlets and the, my goods are uh, being transported from my one factory outlet to other from second to third from third to fourth the fourth to third and so on okay now these goods are being transported for various processes and not for sales or purchases i'm not selling these goods to anyone uh, i'm just transferring these goods from one factory premises to other factory premises only for some processes so in that case the sum insured should be the maximum value of goods on the risk at any point of time during the policy period so during these my four factories if the transit on daily basis uh, i would say uh, there are 10 transit on daily basis 10 transit on daily basis and average value of one transit is five, 50 lakh rupees average value of one transit 50 lakh rupees. so what should be my sum insured under the annual policy the sum insured would be 5 crore 10, 10 transit multiplied by 50 lakh rupees that is average per transit value so my sum insured under the policy should be 5 crore rupees because due, at any point of time the maximum value at risk is 5 crore although practically it is not possible but there could be a possibility that all the 10 transit all the 10 trucks can can be destroyed uh, at any point of time so in that case the uh, maximum liability of the insurance company would be 5 crore rupees the minimum limit of sum insured is stated as below this is this was fixed by uh, TSE tariff advisory committee who has initially drafted this policy annual policy shall be subject to condition of average now how does the condition of average apply so if at the time of claim the insurance company comes to know that uh, at any point of time the value of all the goods in transit at risk is rupees 6 crore and i have opted for some insured of rupees 5 crore only then my loss will be uh, reduced in such proportion and i will be considered as being my own insurer okay so that's how the condition of average will be applicable under annual policy the sum insured shall stand uh, reinstated on a valid claim arising subject to payment of pro rate additional premium on the reinstated amount by the assured counting from the date of loss till the expiry of the insurance this condition is identical to your condition number 15 aift 2001 condition number 15 reinstatement of premium that the sum insured must be maintained uh, to its fullest uh, during the currency of the policy and after happening of a loss if the insured does not uh, uh, choose to exercise its option to reinstate the sum insured the reinstatement page, premium from the date of loss till the date of expiry of the policy will be deducted from the claim amount condition number 15 aift okay so this is similar sum insured uh, stands reduced after payment of the claim unless reinstatement premium has been deducted from the claim amount then only the sum insured will stand reinstated okay total liability of the insurer during the period of the policy shall not exceed twice the sum insured so you cannot just keep on deducting re reinstatement premium from the claim amount and uh, get the sum insured reinstated for n number of times this is not permissible 
you uh, maximum you can do is for twice for twice the submission once you have paid twice the submission under the policy the policy stands null and void what should be the basis of valuation under this policy prime cost plus expenses incidental to transit and charges of insurance and this policy is not subject to adjustment clause there is no adjustment because we are not covering turnover always remember only those policies which covers the turnover of goods being transited in 12 months of period or any other uh, duration those policies only are subject to adjustment clause like open policy like annual sales turnover policy because what we cover we cover the entire turnover uh, during the 12 months here we are not covering the turnover what we are covering we are covering uh, maximum risk at any point of time maximum uh, maximum value of value at risk at any point of time so that's why this policy is not subject to adjustment clause increased value insurance any doubt so far no sir okay okay increased value insurance policy this insurance is on increased value by reason of market value of the goods at destination on date of landing being higher than the cif value we all know that 90% uh, of the uh, international trade is still through sea mode of transit 90% okay so uh, when goods arrived at place of destination uh, i mean it takes a time of say 20 days or 25 days or even months sometimes the sea transit even takes months so uh, when the goods were original originally dispatched from the country of origin and when it actually arrives at the place of destination or or port of destination the value of goods might have shooten up okay so this happens with crude oils this happens with many other commodities this happen this happen with nuclear uh, substances so in uh, this insurance is affected for commodities which are subject to rapid and frequent market fluctuation so as uh, some of you says that uh, uh, there is a trans, there is a war between russia and ukraine so there actually there was no war at the time of dispatch of crude oil from russia okay now the, there is a war between russia and ukraine so if there is a loss uh, loss or damage to the goods or cargo and if the the consign uh, the consignee the indian consignee wants to purchase that cargo again he has to pay the higher price so the difference the difference between the actual invoice value and the increased value will be paid under the increased value insurance policy the coverage is in respect of goods imported in india now stand alone increased value poli policy cannot be issued there has to be corresponding policy on cargo covering cif value you cannot issue stand alone increased value insurance policy suppose cif value of your cargo is 100 rupees and uh, i mean you are assuming that uh, the value of commodity uh, may increased by 30% so while the time by the time the cargo arrives at port in india the value of the com commodity may uh, rise rise to 130 rupees 100 rupees original and 30 rupees increase so 130 rupees so you cannot arrange insurance for 30 rupees only that is increased value stand alone insurance of increased value policy is not permissible the uh, there has to be a cif policy uh, there has to be a policy uh, on cargo covering cif value that there has to be corresponding policy which covers that 100 rupees of cif value and then you can uh, uh, opt for another 30 rupees of increased value insurance policy plus the coverage granted and in both the uh, policy must be identical and the coverage uh, the uh, the claim must be admissible in the basic uh, cif value policy first then and then only the claim can be admitted under the increased value insurance policy this is 
exactly identical to your material damage provision under consequential loss policy, fire loss or profit policy. There is a material damage provision that the claim must be admitted in fire policy first, material damage policy first, and then only the claim is admissible. Here. So this is the same provision, identical. The coverage and duration should be identical to the corresponding car, uh, cargo insurance policy and not higher. You cannot grant coverage higher in the uh, in increased value policy than the basic CIF value policy. Because if the coverage is lower in CIF policy and the claim is not admitted here, then you can also not pay the claim under increased value insurance policy. And there will be, there will be dispute because you have granted coverage higher in increased value policy. Then the insurer will ask you that the claim is, although it is not payable under cargo policy, it is payable under increased value policy because you have granted higher coverage. So that's why this practice should be avoided. You should not grant higher coverage in increased value insurance policy. This is not a valid policy. The losses are payable on actual basis subject to sum insured. Okay. The maximum liability is 75% of the sum insured or 75% of the actual loss suffered, whichever is lower. This is the maximum liability payable into the policy. The insured must bear 25% of each and every loss. So if I simply ask you, what is the excess or policy deductible for increased value insurance policy? It is 25% of each and every loss because you have to bear 25%. Condition of average shall apply, okay. If you have estimated increase in value of 30% if, and if the, uh, there is uh, increase in value of 40%, then the condition of average will apply. The policy is not assignable. duty insurance policy this insurance is on duty uh, excuse me sir ah, yes yes uh, sir so increased value is, will be exclusive for imports only sir yes 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 uh, correct uh, look the increased value policy is for import only the increased value policy can be opted by indian consignee only or you can say indian buyer only and there will be no further uh, what you can say, the no further, uh, the insurable interest will not passes from Indian consignee or Indian buyer to anyone else. That is the reason why increased value policy is not assignable. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Duty insurance policy. The insurance is on duty payable to the custom department. Again, it is only for goods imported in India. Again, standalone duty policy cannot be given. There has to be corresponding uh, policy on cargo covering CIF value. The loss, must, the loss must be admitted there first. And then in them only, the claim is payable under duty insurance policy. The coverage and duration should be identical to the corresponding uh, cargo insurance policy and not higher. This is not a valued policy. So the loss is payable on actual basis. Although there is no provision for deduction of 25%, like in increased value insurance, but the claim is payable on actual uh, well, actual loss basis. This policy, these two policies, increased value and duty insurance policy is subject to principle of strict indemnity. And the assured should lodge a claim with the custom authority within the stipulated time, six months from the date of payment of duty for refund of duty. And this policy is again, not assignable. Seller's interest policy or seller's contingency policy. Again, one of the mysterious policy or least understood policy. Seller's interest policy. So what is the require? Why does the requirement of uh, seller's interest policy arise? So there are situations in which seller will continue to have insurable interest though the title to the goods has passed to the buyer. If I ask you, when does the title of goods passes from seller to buyer under FOB contract? When does the title of when goods... it is loaded on the board of the ship? Correct, correct, correct. When the, the, when the goods board. passes the ship's rail placed safely on board of the vessel, the title passes from the seller to buyer. Okay. However, the seller has shipped the goods on credit. He has given credit of say 30 days or 60 days to, to the buyer. 
in that case the buyer will not make immediate payment in in that case the requirement of issuance of letter of credit will also not arise okay because he has sold goods on credit again the buyer will not make payment uh, immediately so if the goods uh, arrives uh, to the buyer in damaged condition there may be possibility that the buyer rejects the goods and of course since he has uh, rejected the uh, goods he will not make payment for the consignment so in that case the insurable interest will still remain with the seller okay and an insurable interest which reattaches after happening of a contingency is called contingent insurable interest section 18 we have already learned that section 18 of marine insurance act defeasible as well as insurable uh, sorry uh, contingent insurable interest both are insurable you can cover both uh, both of uh, insurable interest so this is a example of contingent insurable interest because the buyer has not make any payment and he has rejected the cargo as well the insurable interest lies with the seller so uh, this policy can be issued only for the valued clients this policy is issued only for the goods or consignment shipped on fob and cfr in quotas only not for cif there is no need for seller's interest policy under cif in quotas why why only for fob and cfr in quotas only because under cif in quotas there is an obligation on the insurance company uh, sorry there is an obligation on the seller to arrange insurance on behalf of the buyer at least up to port of discharge correct so under cif in quotas the assignment is automatic so uh, even after the fob port uh, fob point the insurance remains in force and the policy gets assigned to the buyer automatically so if the goods arrive in damaged condition to the buyer he can simply claim from the insurer of the seller since the policy has been assigned to the buyer that is not the case in fob and cfr that is not the case because there is no obligation under fob and cfr in quotas for arranging insurance on behalf of the buyer on there is no such obligation on the seller for arranging insurance on behalf of the buyer so they if the uh, goods are placed safely on board the vessel that is on fob point if the goods are placed on fob points and the, the seller's interest uh, the seller's risk uh, ceases to exist and the buyer uh, buyer's risk start from that point so if before fob point the seller has not assigned the policy to buyer please pay attention to this uh, particular scene if uh, before fob point the seller has not assigned the policy to the buyer after fob point when the seller has no insurable interest can he assign the policy subsequently no sir no exactly no we have already discussed this in marine insurance act right so if a person who has no insurable interest in the goods if he has parted his ways with the goods he cannot assign the policy subsequently because he has no insurable interest in the goods if he has not insurable interest in the goods he has no insurable interest in the policy as well and if he he has no insurable interest in the policy he cannot assign the policy so if the seller has not assigned the policy before the fob point in favor of the buyer he cannot assign the policy subsequently and if he cannot assign the uh, policy subsequently there is no coverage in respect of buyer under fob and cfr in quotas only so when the goods arrives to the buyer and he knows that there is no insurance coverage available to me he will reject the cargo then in that case now in this entire scenario 
the insurable interest has already ceased to exist of seller after FOB point. The buyer has not in, uh, not insured the cargo or he has not acquired insurable interest in the policy of the seller. So in that case, the pol uh, there is no coverage at all. So by uh, by opting for uh, by opting the seller's interest policy or seller's contingency policy, the seller reacquires the insurable interest, which is called the contingent insurable interest as per section 18. Correct? The entire concept is clear. What is the need? What is the need for seller's interest yes, or seller's contingency policy? Okay. Why it is required only in, uh, only for FOB and CNDF inco terms and why not for CIF? Because under CIF, there is contractual obligation. The assignment is automatic. If, even if the goods are damaged, the buyer can claim the uh, damages from the, uh, in the insurance policy of seller. That is not the case in uh, for FOB and CFR inco terms. That's why... Uh, requirement of seller's contingency policy arises here. This policy covers physical loss or damage to the cargo insured subject to the terms and conditions of the policy to protect only the interest of the insured mentioned therein. The insurance is not assignable to any other person who may acquire insurable interest in respect of the uh, property insured excepting a banker operating in India. Any assignment under the uh, any assignment other than uh, as stated shall render this policy void. So these policies are not assignable. Only assignment which is permissible is uh, assignment in favor of banker operating in India. Financier who has financed the uh, adventure. The assured should not disclose. This is called the warranty of secrecy. This is available in a seller's contingency policy as well and buyer's contingency. This is called warranty of secrecy. That is the assured should not disclose to the consignee or any other party who may have interest in the insured goods about the existence of a policy taken to cover the seller's interest. What was the need behind incorporation of this warranty? What will happen if the assured disclose to the buyer or consignee that, look, I have, uh, I have arranged this seller's interest policy or seller's contingency policy? What will happen? the buyer will not arrange on his behalf for his part of journey. The buyer will not arrange because buyer is satisfied that the insured has, uh, the seller has uh, obtained seller's interest policy. And if I, reject, if I reject the cargo, he will get claim from his insurance policy. So buyer will not arrange at all for his part of journey. He will remain uninsured. He will not incur expenses. That is the reason there is a warranty of secrecy that assured should not disclose to the consignee or any other party who may have interest in the insured goods about existence of the policy. Second warranty, warranted that the insured shall not change the terms of the contract of sale relating to the goods insured here under subsequent to the operation of a peril insured against for the purpose of secure, uh, securing indemnity under the policy. The seller is not supposed to change the terms of the contract. Contract of what? Contract of sale between the seller and buyer. So if the goods are shipped on CIF value to which seller's contingency policy is not applicable at all, okay, the goods uh, reaches the buyer in damaged condition. So the seller is uh, seller cannot change the term of contract from CIF to FOB and CFR and can claim under the seller's contingency policy. It is not permissible. Warranted that the insured shall safeguard all contractual and other rights against the buyer, carriers and other parties concerned with the transaction and transport of the goods covered therein. This is a non-contributing policy. Both the policies, that is seller's contingency policy and buyer's contingency policy. This is non-contributing policy. This is on difference in condition term. I mean, uh, some of you who are... Uh, reading about fire insurance, you must have gone through condition number four of AIFT. Condition number four says that is marine clause. Now that marine clause makes it non-contributing policy. That the, if there is subsisting marine insurance policy, the claim will be paid there first. There will be no contribution. 
the claim will be paid there uh, that under that policy first and if any amount which remains uh, unpaid then the insured can claim under the fire policy that is marine clause condition number 4 then you have declaration policies under fire uh, fire de uh, floater declaration policies declaration policies are also non contributing policies that if there is a declaration policy and there is corresponding uh, standard fire and special perils policy what will happen if there is a loss, the, the loss will not at all be contributed over both the policies. The loss will first be paid under the SFSP policy. If there is uh, any amount which remains unpaid, then and then only it will be paid under the declaration policy. That is the concept here for sailors contingency and bar contingency policy. The policies are non-contributing policies. No claim shall be payable here under if either the named insured or buyer of the insured goods is entitled to indemnification under any other policy covering the same goods. So if the buyer is arranged for his uh, part of journey, the claim will be paid there uh, first. If any amount which remains unpaid, the seller can claim under this policy. Claims, if any, are payable, under, uh, payable in Indian currency only. Underwriters shall be subrogated to the assured's right against third parties. The policy does not cover risk which could be covered or which are insurable by the Export Credit Guarantee Corporation of India Limited, that is ECGC. Now, what does it say? Again, the purpose of sailors contingency policy is to cover physical loss only. For example, wait a minute. The policy covers physical loss or damage to the goods or cargo of the insured. That means rejection by buyer should be on the ground of damage physical damage to the goods only the buyer if the buyer rejects the cargo stating that uh, i'm I, i'm insolvent i'm bankrupt i'm not in a position to pay you that's why i'm rejecting the cargo although the cargo is in sound condition there is no loss or damage to the cargo but if the buyer is rejecting the cargo solely due to reason of uh, his in uh, capacity to uh, pay for the consignment, the claim can uh, the seller cannot claim under the seller's contingency policy. For that, he uh, he has to approach the ECGC, that is Export Credit Guarantee Corporation of India. Okay, this is seller's contingency policy. Any question? No, sir. Okay. okay. This is buyer's contingency policy. Now, what does buyer's contingency policy says? So under CIF INCO terms, there is an obligation on the seller to arrange insurance on behalf of the buyer up to the, at least up to the port of discharge, but only for ICCC cover only for the basic cover that is ICCC. There is no obligation that the seller has to arrange the insurance for uh, all risk ICCA or ICCB. So if the seller arrange the insurance on ICCC only, and if the buyer wishes to uh, cover his consignment for wider coverage, for example, ICCA, so he can opt for buyer's interest policy buyer's contingency policy. Again, I, I guess I, I forgot to inform you that the seller's contingency policy is not non-assignable. Okay. No. Okay. We have discussed it. So buyer's interest policy is also not, not assignable. If the buyer wishes to cover his goods for uh, higher coverage, this policy comes into play. The assured should not disclose. Again, this policy also has the warranty of secrecy that the existence of this policy must, uh, uh, must remain secret. The assured should not disclose to the seller or any other party who may have interest in the insured goods about the existence of the policy. The policy is not assignable. And this, this policy is also non-contributing policy. That means if there are two simultaneous policy covering identical goods, and if the goods is payable in other policy, the claim should be uh, paid in that policy only. If any amount remains unclaimed, uh, unpaid, then and then only they can claim under the buyer's policy. And last 
policy is i guess a uh, stock throughput policy we do not issue stock throughput policy in india first and foremost stock throughput policy is nothing but combination of marine cargo policy and sfsp policy uh, standard fire special tariffs policy so st stock throughput policy ensures seamless cover during transit as well as during storage i'm talking about intentional storage not incidental storage storage incidental to transit are by default covered by virtue of clause number 8.4 of icc okay so there is no need to cover incidental transit uh, incidental storage but i am talking about uh, intentional storage or uh, so th stock throughput policy is combination of those uh, those two policies marine and uh, sfsp we do not issue this policy in india also gic revived its circular dated uh, 31st march 2019 with effect from 1st april 2019 uh, gic re has stopped giving coverage for intentional storage to any of its insurers so before 1st april 2019 we used to give coverage uh, for intentional or intermediate storage as well but uh, with uh, effect from that date we have stopped giving coverage for intentional inter, uh, intermediate storage static storage that is stock throughput policy so uh, we have covered all the 10 important policies i guess uh, should we conclude the lecture here sir so as you wish sir okay any doubts no sir till now no doubt sir till now no doubt sir i mean this is surprising you know, as far as marine insurance is concerned you should be full of doubts i guess literally no doubts okay yes sir Yes, okay sir. okay so we are concluding the lecture here okay thank you so much thank sir, you thank I you so think much one thing I, i want to ask sir can ah. we will share the ppt with the in the group also yes yes i'll share the ppt okay okay thank you so much sir thank you so okay. much okay thank, thank you sir thank you very much okay okay thank you